to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. This meeting is being televised by Chelsea Media. Is anyone else president plans to record? Welcome. Um, just so people know, we are reopening um, this session. We started off with an executive session on school security, and so now we're uh, coming back to regular session and open session. Uh, so first order of business is um, consent agenda for our meeting of January 8th. I move that we approve the minutes of the regular school committee meeting of January 8th. Any seconds? Second. Seconds. Okay. Any discussions? Any corrections? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any abstentions? I abstain. So four and one abstention. All right. So uh, moving on, uh, next up is our Chelmsford High School student representatives. Um, at the high school, semester two started today. Um, on the February 25th and 26th, um, our Theater Guild's production of Our Time, Our Town will be shown in the pack, um, and there will be an early release day on February 6th. Um, MCAS bio retest will be on the 6th and 7th, and there will be 8th grade parent night for the upcoming freshman class on February 7th in the pack at 6.30. Um, and a congratulations to Matthew Waterman, who earned a 36 composite on his ACT. Um, two tenths of 1% earned a top score, and it is about 3,000 out of how many million? One, a lot. A couple <laughs> million that um, earned this score, so this is a very big achievement. <laughs> Uh, any good news? Yeah, I have to be a little honest with you. I'm nervous with the microphones being this loud in my voice, so I'm going to try and regulate my voice today. So um, we have a few items for good news. So the Biome School kicked off their reading Rocks Enrichment. It supports their winter reading challenge, so the kids are getting ready to read all their books and present to their, um, their, their uh, peers what they're reading. Um, we have three Parker teachers who have created a new program at Parker. It's called uh, Parker Perks, and it was created by Dina Weck, Christina Kurth, and Jenna Raffaello. And what they're doing is every other Friday starting this, I know they start already, but this Friday they have one of them. They have a coffee hour from 8.30 to 9.30. And what this does is it provides an opportunity for students in specialized programs to gain those valuable skills of communication. So if you're available and you want to swing by, it starts this Friday and every other Friday from there. Um, Chelmsford High School is the recipient of 10 Lenovo virtual reality headsets. It was a grant from Lenovo to be able to use these headsets in the schools. So hopefully you'll be seeing those soon. And um, the new student help desk started today. Students are either participating in a course at Chelmsford High School, which is the technology troubleshooting and repair course, or they were a summer technician crew and they had that experience and they were chosen, they were able to take this course and now they're working up to do some of the, the tech repair themselves. So that's great at Chelmsford High School. And then just up and coming, uh, starting this week, we're gonna be uh, starting the orientation for our te teachers to come. We, I know we have Brian Atchison here to talk about his experience, which kind of started with the T program. That's our teaching excellence and achievement. That's where our international teachers are coming. So this Thursday is the um, kickoff introduction with them at UMass Lowell. So we're excited to have those teachers come with us. How long are they here? They're here for six weeks. And what happens is they kind of integrate into the schools because um, they also do a lot of uh, uh, things around the area and in Boston. So it's a six week program. Uh, Matthew and I will be there on Thursday to greet them. All right. Anybody else have any good news? Uh, moving on, we're into public comment. Uh, if anybody would like to come up to speak to the committee about any of the items on tonight's agenda, please come forward and state your name and address for the recording secretary. Okay. All right, moving on to new business. Thank you. Um, oh, do you want to invite George and Terry? You can. Oh, okay. Uh, so we'd actually like to invite uh, Mr. George Simonian and uh, Terry, come on up, uh, from our Alumni Association. Uh, they're going to talk to us a little bit tonight about the Hall of Fame inductees for this year. Yes, we are. Welcome, you guys. More good news. Mm -hmm. Good so evening. Right good news. The Chelsea High School Alumni Association proudly announces its 29th annual Hall of Fame induction. The ceremony will take place on the evening of the 23rd of March, 2019, at the University of Massachusetts Lowell Conference Center in Lowell. The program will include a social at 5.45, dinner at 6.30, and the induction takes place at 7. Those being inducted are as follows. Gail Mullen Bowden, class of 1979. Lauren H. Cochran, teacher. 
Mara Devaney Dua Asamoah, class of 1988. William Gillette Jr., class of 1989. Patricia Galvin McCafferty, class of 1976. Peter J. McHugh, class of 1964. Judy Merrill Metz, class of 1973. Michael G. O'Keefe, class of 1987. Louise Quinn Tremblay, class of 1962. The Alumni Association will also present its Lucy E. Simonian Golden Lion Award, which is given to an organization or an individual who has been an extraordinary supporter of the students of Chemsford High School over the years. This year, the recipient will be Evelyn S. Thorne, and the presentation will be made at the induction ceremony. Hello. For information relative to the purchase of tickets for the induction ceremony, you can either call Terry at 978-251-3788 or myself at 978-256-3100. Questions? I just happened to be at Evelyn's house when she got, I brought her mail in because she is <laughs> can't get around, and she opened up your letter. Good. When she was Great. very, she very, she was very <laughs> excited. Yeah. yeah. She was well, very, very a, excited. She's done an awful lot very, for very, our school. Very worthy. Very worthy. Yeah. yeah. And where is it being held again this year? Where? Where? UMass Senate Conference. UMass, Conference, 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 Conference Same as last year. Okay. Yeah, it was. It, it went very well last year. Yeah. We were very pleased. Yeah. Right. And they want us back. <laughs> and we want to go back. Yeah. Right. No, it, it worked. It worked out very well. Right. They uh, they really treated us nicely. A little different than the mine. <laughs> <Right. Yeah. laughs> Behave yourself. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, it sounds the like a question. great. No, it's a great, like a great, class. great group. Yeah. Okay. What, what? Tickets are sixty dollars. Oh, sixty dollars. Yeah. I have them. Uh, take us now. Anyway, <laughs> we'll take your names. But I, you'll all be there. I know that. Okay. Great. But uh, it's another great group, and um, uh, I, 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 the committee meets at my house, and I, I listen to them. Okay. I'm part of the committee, but it, the, the, the caliber of people that will get nominated, it's just, it's um, in fact, early in the discussions, I said to the committee, I said, look, why don't we infect all 19 and just get it over with? Okay, and start fresh next year. Okay, because it, it's hard to choose. From the people who get nominated, it's just unbelievable what some of our grads are doing. George, how many people overall are in the Hall of Fame at this point? Okay, if you multiply nine by what did I say, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, twenty-nine. Yeah. Got math teacher back you? there. What are you? Sixty-one. It's it's just great, and, and the, the nicest thing about this is, it's you know, it's it's all in all encompassing. Okay, because I can I can remember back. When I was the principal, okay, we wanted to get a Hall of Fame going, and I, I had some problems with it because most Hall of Fames are athletic, and mm -hmm. and I wouldn't, I wouldn't entertain that, okay. I wanted this kind of a Hall of Fame, and of course it never happened. So as soon as we started the Alumni Association, bang, we started that. Well, actually, the second year was our first 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 group, and uh, it's all inclusive. Even though we great athletes, right. we had. I mean, we an, an, an Olympian that performed in two Olympics, a Stanley Cup winner with three Stanley Cup rings. I mean, so we do have athletes, okay? But uh, well, there's one right here, okay? State champion wrestler, okay? But uh, so it's it's all, all encompassing, which is nice. Right. Right. I'm just yeah, going to yeah, say, this yeah. might be a good time to remind people that you can nominate people. A lot of times we get conversations that, you know, so and so ought to be in the Alumni Hall of, Hall of Fame. But it helps a lot if somebody nominates them. Well, this happened a couple, couple of years ago. At the yeah. 4th of July, a man came up to me at the booth, and he said, he said, why don't you be able to jack my sister? Well, who's your sister? Okay. <laughs> well, so he said, well, he gave her a married name. I, I didn't, didn't ring any bells. And then we told her her married name. Oh, well, what is she doing? He said, well, I just well, nominate her. Right. And, of course, that year she went right in because it's unbelievable what she's been doing. Okay. Well, yeah, that, right. Again, thanks, Al. That's, that's – that, we, we won't know unless somebody comes and tells us and, and nominates the person, right? okay? And to reduce the burden, we have created a committee to help people with the nomination process because it can be a little daunting, and I think that in past years has held people back from making somebody a nominee. Now with this committee, they'll work with the individual and help them with the nominating process so that worthy candidates can come in, and we get a lot of them. And what happens that with that, with that, where that's working is that the uh, most of the nominations are about equal. In other words, the work that's done, the presentations are about equal. Okay. Of course, you know, we don't get one with you know 30 pages of recommendations and one with just one page. Okay, 
they're all, you know, the kind of level of playing field so that the people who are being nominated, they all get why they're being nominated. I want to point out, too, just besides the Hall of Fame, you know, the Alumni Association does a lot in terms of scholarships and everything else. I mean, Oh, we'll be back to yeah. talk about our scholarship awards. Yeah, I'll, I'll be back. I'll Count be back. I'll be back. Right. By the way, we're up to 132 scholarships. Thank you very much for, uh, Good to see you. for Thank you for having us. us. Thanks for having us. See you there. Uh, Thank you. Care. 23rd of March. Thank you. I'll be there. All right, Next our uh, second um, presentation of the evening, this is our spotlight on mathematics, and didn't even invite him up, but he's already moving. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Matthew Branavant, and he has some staff with him tonight that I'll allow him to introduce. Take your time and get set up. Uh, but again, this is just going to continue with our um, um, agenda where each, each school committee meeting, we either have a school come and present on what they're doing or a department talk about some of the work that they're doing in the school system. So we're excited to hear tonight about mathematics and uh, happy to have you guys come. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Lang. I did get the head nod from Dr. Hirsch, so I was ready to come up. So tonight we're <laughs> going to spend some time uh, and discuss the mathematics. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hirsch, Dr. Lang, and members of the school committee for inviting us to come here and present. I'd like to first begin by sharing a little bit of an introduction as to who we are. Uh, I am the Mathematics Department Coordinator, K-12, uh, for the school district. This here is Dan Williams. He's a Chelmsford High School mathematics teacher. Next is Amanda, uh, excuse me, Donna Foley, who's the middle school uh, math coach within the district. Amanda Noble, seventh grade Parker teacher uh, for mathematics. And then our elementary math coach, Ann Swisbin. And so we've come before you in previous years to give presentations. And what we try to do this evening is to not necessarily rehash the same things over and over again. Instead, what we're planning on doing tonight is kind of sharing some updates as to things that's been happening in the last couple of years. Spend some time talking about the mathematics uh, philosophy for education. And then also talking about some hot button issues that might be coming up or have come up within our department. So you are made aware as well as the people who are listening this evening um, to this video as to what's happening within our department. So the first thing I want to share is the philosophy K-12 to of the mathematics department. And there are three areas in particular. The first is that we really believe in the idea of conceptual understanding. We want to promote the idea of having students learning how to solve problems more than one way. As we heard in a question this evening where there's a quick math question given to all of us, 29 times 9 to try to figure out how many people are inducted in the Hall of Fame. There's more than one way to do that. One of us, we just briefly talked about it, said, let's do 30 times 9 and then subtract 9. You could do 29 times 10 and then subtract 29 from it. You could break it up a variety of different ways. And our mathematics curriculum and instruction really tries to promote solving problems more than one way. Because if you do that, you really build on conceptual understanding as opposed to just trying to memorize something. Memorizing negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a really doesn't help our students. We want them to know and understand the quadratic formula. The second thing is we really want to try to promote joyful mathematics within the district and within our classrooms. Within the STEM field, the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, three out of those four we often see, not necessarily in Chelmsford, but as a uh, United States of America, those areas students really enjoy learning them. And then you have the ugly stepsister of mathematics. And so what we want to do is really promote joyful learning where the experiences and activities that students uh, receive make them want to learn the mathematics as opposed to just being forced to do that. So that's our K-12 philosophy as well. And finally, the idea of growth mindset. And Amanda Noble, a seventh grade Parker teacher, will be spending some time talking to you this evening about growth mindset and what we are doing within this school district for students and our teachers to really promote growth mindset as part as our learning experience in the classroom. So I'll now turn it over to Dan Williams, high school math teacher, who will share a little bit about uh, what exactly we are doing at the high school level. Thank you. 
So my name is Dan Williams, and I'm a mathematics teacher at the high school. I currently teach geometry and trigonometry. We have 18 teachers in the high school math department, and uh, we haven't, we've haven't. we had the same teachers here for four years. We haven't had any change, so we have a great crew and really all get along very well. First off, the picture on the left is our high school mathematics scope and sequence. It shows all the different courses we have and all the different paths. There's a lot of options for our students to go through. Whether you uh, want to take AP classes, we have AP Calc, AB, Calc BC, Intro to Stats. We have two AP Computer Science courses, all the way through college prep or remedial math. We have something for everybody, and we really can suit all their needs. Um, one of the courses that we just added in this year is called Quantitative Reasoning. It's taught by two of our teachers, Zach McIntyre and Matt Whitty. It's a two separate semesters course. So one semester you have Zach McIntyre, one semester you have Matt Whitty. And it's really interesting because it's a little bit more real life mathematics. And um, it's something kids have really enjoyed so far. Uh, the part that Zach teaches it focuses on stocks, car interest rates, inflation, personal finance, and budget. And the part that Matt teaches is about being like a realtor and you're researching home market data analysis to make conjectures for logical progression of market trends, calculate mortgage rates and loans, calculate commission percentages, taxes and proration, escrow, closing costs, down payment and residency budget. So it's been a really nice addition to our uh, scope and sequence. Um, you can see up there our new textbooks and curriculum for math courses. Our core classes in general have all gone over to Big Ideas Math, which is in line with our middle schools. And it's really helped put us working through nicely and not rehashing the same material or teaching it different ways. It's made us as a uh, department much more streamlined and efficient. Uh, and then even courses that didn't go to Big Ideas, we've reworked the curriculum and made it all fit in nicely. And we also always are encouraging new technology in the classrooms. Over the years, we've uh, invested in TI Inspire calculators. Uh, we use different websites, such as one is IXL.com, which is great for skill-based practice. Another one is NoRe.com, which you could almost, it's like, um, think of it like Khan Academy, but you can make it more how you want it to be, put in exact videos, create the class that you want to be. Uh, many people are using Eno boards or uh, Apple TV, integrating Google Classroom into our classroom as well. Uh, there is a new club this year called the CHS TED Ed Club. And this club, although not limited to mathematics, there's a new club at the high school run by Matthew in which students are working to give their own TED Talk at the high school this spring. So really exciting club. We also have a math team that is uh, coached by uh, one of our teachers, Catherine Delamis. We have 20 members in the club. Every week they have a practice and they work on problems and concepts for these math competitions they compete in. They compete in the Greater Boston Math League and the New England Math League. There's one um, event each month that they compete in. And uh, throughout this year, we have come in second place in each Greater Boston Math League event so far. So we're doing really well this year. And lastly, we're preparing for the new MCAS. It's going to be the first year that the high school um, <coughs> takes part in the new MCAS that the curriculum has changed a little bit for, and it's all based on computers. So going to things like those IXL and NORI that I mentioned before has helped prepare our students to be uh, prepared for this MCAS and just reworking our curriculums to meet all the new needs for the MCAS versus the previous ones that we've done before. Thank you. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Donna Foley. I'm the middle school math coach for those of you who don't know me. Uh, I've been with um, Chumps Public Schools now for 45 years. Um, and it's, it's a great length of time. It's a wonderful, wonderful job. I've been a math teacher at the middle school and high school, uh, math coordinator, and now working as the role of math coach. A very exciting role. As all of you know, in 45 years, mathematics has transitioned from just doing arithmetic to teaching mathematics. Our teachers, our marvelous middle school teachers, have transitioned with us. Many of them have gone to multiple workshops and take lots and lots of different math classes to move along with the curriculum. As Dan stated, uh, we use the big ideas math starting in grade six. It dovetails into math expressions, which Ann will talk about in a little, in a little while. Uh, and it's very nice that the big ideas math carries from sixth grade through the high school. Uh, the technologies that we're using, basically there are three. 
We use BigIdeasMath.com, which the, a lot of the students do homework, quizzes and tests. We can do that online. When the students do their homework online, the teachers actually get the results be, that morning when they go in, and so they're not spending a lot of time going over homework questions that everybody got correct, yet instead they can dedicate their time to the ones the students had difficulty with. We also use IXL, which Dan mentioned. IXL is a skill-based, um, and rather than problem solving, I would say it's more skill-based for students that need work with skill. And then we also use iReady, the iReady program that we're using for both math and ELA, which is a diagnostic program and also prescriptive, which our students go into, and it can set the stages for them. Um, so again, great technology. The teachers have had to learn the technology. We've learned the technology, and the students are probably better at it than we are. Um, as a, like in the high school, they participate in math clubs, the math team, where only 20 students participate in that. In the middle school, we have all students participate in two different math contests. We have them participate in continental math, which is five questions, uh, once a month that runs between November and March. I've put a couple sample questions up there for you for grades six to eight. Uh, when people at home want to try these, if you don't get the answers, just give us a call and we'll make sure that we give you the correct solution. <laughs> Uh, these are challenging questions for students, so it's not a time reference thing because they have 30, 30 minutes to try six questions. There are, they're all different, unique problem-solving questions where students will have an opportunity to try things, as, as, excuse me, as Matthew mentioned, in many different ways. There are multiple ways for students to get the answers. We like to use these with the students afterwards to see how they got the solutions to the questions and go over the variety of the variety of learning styles. The next, the next is the New England Math League. Again, all of our students participate. This is a little bit different because the, thir the students have 35 questions to do in 30 minutes. There's lots of little tricks in these questions. Students are allowed to use a calculator here. But the calculator isn't always the best or the most efficient way to solve a problem. So what we'll find out, as from these students, we use both of these contests for students to help us with placement because they each give us a different, um, well, a different view. Uh, our sixth grade level for placements, the sixth are heterogeneously grouped with support classes and also co-taught classes, seventh grade. We have honors accelerated grade level, and then we have supported and co-taught classes. In eighth grade, we have the honors accelerated, um, the grade level and supported and co-taught. We keep spreadsheets with all of the data on all of the students to try to make the best decision as where we're going to um, place students so that they are challenged but not overwhelmed. Uh, we take a lot of time going through this and the teacher's recommendations. Um, then we have our new ways of teaching math which now we're going to pass this over to Amanda, and she's going to help us with kind of <coughs> explaining what we're talking about with the growth mindset. So um, my name is Amanda Noble. I teach seventh grade at Parker, and I'm going to briefly talk about growth mindset and what we as a department are really looking into and have been doing. So growth mindset for us is not just one of those buzzwords that we're just going to throw around and next year will be something else. We've kind of been working with this idea for a few years now, and we're really actively participating um, with the students and with our colleagues. Um, growth mindset is the thought that your ability in something can grow, can change over time, where the fixed mindset is you're born with these abilities and that's it. And that looks like in the math classroom is we see students that will come to us and say, I've never been good at math, so my parents haven't been good at math, so that's it. I'm not gonna be good at math. When we're trying to show these students that your experience in the past is not necessarily your experience in the future, and we've really been trying to show that in the classroom. So um, there's people, Carol Dweck, um, studies have shown that with this growth mindset and your thought process and your effort and perseverance, it's not just, oh, change my mindset and I'm gonna get better grades. No, you have to put in the work, you have to put in the effort and the motivation and you'll see higher achievement. In the classroom, um, creating stations, having 
math be engaging and not just teacher standing in front of the room, worksheets, like we think of math. More engaging. Um, stations allow for different activities for one standard so that students can move around, they can try something, and if they don't like this way, they can try a different way and build that confidence up. It also allows the teacher to um, be part of the classroom and have that small group, give the immediate feedback to students as they're working, um, really be the facilitator, not necessarily the person in charge. Um, other things that we're doing are test retakes, you know, for growth mindset. We don't want to stop the learning. We want them to, you know, if they're getting a bad score and they see that on, we don't want it to stop. We want them to have to work at it, work at trying to do that over again. You know, that immediate feedback, and not just on tests, but if they did a problem and you're walking, and the teacher's walking around checking that off, giving them that confidence right then and there. Um, informal assessments often, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down. And like I said, engaging lessons. We had a um, professional development two weeks ago now uh, with math and science in the middle school to, and was it the high school, high school too? too? Yeah, yeah. High, yeah, middle school and high school. Um, <coughs> really having those, what types of things can we do to engage the students that's not just centers, but just you need to assess, we need to do those things. How can we engage the students that way? Um, and we're having those actual discussions with these kids. What does a growth mindset look like? Do you have a growth mindset? Are you stuck in thinking that you can't do um, better in math? So these are all things that we are doing. Oh. Ann's turn. <laughs> uh, and my name is Ann Swisbin, and I'm the K-5 to math coach. Uh, and I, like Dawn, I have taught math uh, in Chelmsford for many years. And um, I'd want to talk a little bit today, uh, this evening, about um, the K-5 to math curriculum, which is math expressions, where we adopted the 2018 edition uh, this year. And um, unlike some programs that are out there that come out with a new edition, uh, they might change the cover a little bit. They actually, uh, the uh, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, who is the publisher, actually sat down with teachers and got feedback from teachers uh, all over the uh, districts that they work with uh, to find, to uh, look at the program and say what could be improved. Um, it would still, it still works with the Common Core standards and the Massachusetts, uh, 2017 Massachusetts math frameworks. Uh, it still uh, works with the standards for mathematical practice. Uh, it, it has all those wonderful things that um, everyone here just mentioned about using multiple strategies uh, and representations, uh, children talking about the math process, talking about the problem solving with, with the teacher and with, with um, their peers. Um, there's a lot of problem solving. It's not just arithmetic anymore. It's, uh, it's problem solving. It's flexible thinking. It's how do you represent an answer uh, with a m mathematical model, be it a, a picture or an equation. Uh, there's a technology involved that was updated. Uh, there's fluency practice that students can go to at, during, in school, uh, in the computer lab, or at home. Uh, there's parent letters that um, get sent home, or, they, or the parents can also uh, access them online to find out what, what are the students learning in this particular unit, because often what a parent will say, well, that was not how I learned it. That's not how I learned subtraction. I learned it with borrowing. And we don't talk about that anymore. We talk about the conceptual understanding, which was something that Matthew mentioned early on. Um, so there's that support for the parents as well. Uh, in addition, we uh, had a, a very nice summer initiative um, it, this, this past summer with uh, the K-4 to four teachers. And uh, it's resulted in documents called, a document called ECOS, the Elementary Course of Study. And what we tried to do was look at integrating reading lessons, writing lessons, math lessons, science lessons, and social studies lessons. Uh, again, everything, everything's in separate little boxes, and we wanted kids to look at the big, be able to look at the big picture. And they're not going to see the big picture unless we present it to them that way. And um, especially the math and science, there's a lot of crossover there. 
And so we, we looked at the first science uh, kit that each grade level was going to do, and we picked out uh, activities that could also apply in mathematics, be it graphing or uh, making predictions or um, uh, trying to uh, write an explanation to, to something uh, in, in, in math and in science. Uh, and then that led us to looking at some other kinds of problems, some practical problems that really engage the kids. So it's not just uh, a, a worksheet with 20 or 25 problems uh, to get the, quote, right answer. Um, so for example, um, if you look at the picture there on the right-hand side, we have some kiddos uh, on the right. And they, we, one of the uh, little problems we posed with a group of children in fourth grade was to take, to predict uh, how many reams of paper it would take to go from the floor to the ceiling without actually stacking it up. And that was the question. And it was very open-ended. And we grouped the kids uh, in pairs. And we gave them different kinds of measuring devices. Uh, we asked them to predict. Uh, and then to let them come up with the answers. And they, they spent 45 minutes so engaged in this problem. And they made predict great predictions and they used, um, they used their measuring devices every set of activities we want the kids to do. And so the ECOS is the beginning of that. We did that this past summer, thanks to uh, Dr. Hirsch. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and we're going to con hopefully continue and add more, more um, problems to, or more kinds of situations to that to that folder, so teachers have a variety of things to use uh, to engage the students. Okay, so then um, going back to our math expressions program, um, there is a technology component. It's called Think Central, and the site is bookmarked on the home page of each school, um, Byam and uh, Center, Harrington and South Row. And um, I have been in, I've gone into the classrooms to help the teachers show the kids how to get on the program. And then we made handouts for the kids to take home to their parents so that they can get on and they can do, use what's called the personal math trainer, which is a, a new part of that program for um, math expressions. And they can do fluency practice and practice take, taking tests online. And of course, that's very, very important for our third and fourth graders because that's how <coughs> they take their MCAS. So they need to know how to, how to take that test online. Um, and then um, we also have intervention. There is level one intervention in the classroom in small group settings. And the, again, math expression supports that with a variety of um, activities that the teacher has access to through Think Central. We also have Title I math interventionists, which are, are, um, have been hired and work in the different elementary schools. And they pull small groups of students based on feedback and data they get from the teachers uh, f through their formative and summative assessments so that um, those kiddos that might need just a little bit more help are, are getting it. Uh, and then we also, I also um, work with the teachers to find challenging activities and puzzles and games uh, for deep understanding of math concepts as well as the joy of math, to have fun with math. Uh, and then the instructional support. Um, we had developed the pacing guides for math expressions and, as I said, the integration of math topics with reading, writing, math, science, and social studies. We use the iReady for the benchmark testing and, the for and then the teachers have formative and summative assessments as part of the math expressions program. And then periodically we have team meetings. Uh, in, in the different grade levels to discuss uh, and generate ideas to develop new ways of teaching a topic. Uh, and then again, to help kids with intervention or to challenge kids. And then one other thing that grew out of the summer ECOS was uh, in grade four, 11 out of the 17 fourth grade teachers 
uh, wanted to continue the process of meeting throughout the school year. And so once a month I have been meeting with them. We have a little a PLC going. And um, we talk about how, how did those lessons go? What can we do? Did they, anybody find anything that was really whiz bang and great and that we can share with everybody else? So that's a state of elementary math. Thank you for listening. Any any questions from uh, committee or have anything? I, I was just gonna say, I'm pretty, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm losing my voice. Um, I'm pretty sure my daughter's like three years away from being better at math than I am. So. <laughs> <laughs> and, and for the and for the record, how old is she? Uh, she's uh, she's gonna be going into fourth grade, so she's in third yeah. grade. Right now. Okay. <laughs> All right. I do appreciate you didn't make a solve any of those problems because I. Yeah. <laughs> I figured out the ruler one. Yeah. yeah but. Oh. We'll find, we'll find you'd be a very friendly group. If it was a little hostile, we would say take out your pencils and paper and solve for us. Have a long meeting then. Right. Really. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Oh, thank, thank you very much. You. Thank 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 Thank you, everyone. Um, it's the evening of presentations. So the next presentation this evening, um, I'd like to invite up Brian um, Atchison, who's a teacher at the high school. Um, I'm going to help you get your PowerPoint um, up and going. But uh, Brian, if you recall back a few meetings, uh, Linda Tanini had come to present um, as part of her experience <coughs> last summer with the uh, program that she was involved with. Uh, Brian was. Um, with Linda in the same program. He'll, he'll get into it a little bit. Uh, he wasn't able to join us that evening, but he was able to accommodate us tonight. Um, so we wanted to be able to have him in and to hear about your experience because it's really, I think, cool and exciting, particularly with the teachers coming as well, kind of gives that different perspective. So I don't want to uh, take away your presentation. I'm going to get your PowerPoint up right here for you. Right. But uh, welcome you this evening to, to share your uh, thoughts with the school committee. Namaste and thank you for letting me come. Uh, and good evening. And I'll wait till he gets the presentation up. Yep, I'm getting you there. Only because I don't remember what I put in it. <laughs> there you go. All right. Uh, as Dr. Lang said, I'm Brian Atchison, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my experience with the Teachers for Global Cal uh, Classroom, uh, which is an international field experience uh, that uh, has made me a better teacher. And I, I want to share that how it's made me a better teacher and some of the experiences I had that put put it that way. And I'm also going to highlight a little bit about the Teachers for uh, Teacher Achievement and Excellence program uh, that uh, will be joining us in the very near future. Um, so the programs are offered and presented by the United States Department of State and a group called IREX, which helps manage the programs. Um, and it leads towards a mutual understanding. It, it provides with um, an opportunity for international education and uh, a, a way for us to kind of clear out those international borders when it comes to education and open it up for dialogue amongst teachers of different countries uh, to kind of build a better community uh, focusing on things such as global issues and education issues. Um, so as you can see from the slides, some of the programs are there on the right. Um, uh, in the coming years, it's going to be a Fulbright scholarship program. Uh, so that's a pretty distinguished uh, scholarship program. So it's pretty exciting. Uh, a little bit about the programs. Uh, they focus on bringing teachers together uh, and training them in ways of uh, opening, like I said, opening up the borders. Uh, training teachers to think beyond just their classroom, beyond just their school, beyond their community, and thinking in a global manner, and helping that progress from the teachers down to the students, and give them the opportunity to start thinking that, hey, the little things I can do here might make a difference somewhere else in the world. And uh, I'll go back. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's right. Um, and through through that training, it leads towards further opportunities, uh, and it. Uh, awarded some of us the opportunity to travel to different countries to actually interact and work with teachers and I had the the blessings of going over to India and part of this is a way to increase diplomacy as well and break down some of the barriers uh, between different countries the countries we traveled to were not 
necessarily known as the first class countries in education. We weren't traveling to Finland. We were traveling to areas like I went to India and people went to Morocco and uh, Linda Tanini went to uh, Indonesia. So there were a variety of countries that are not necessarily known for their education and the goal is to bring those countries together with us and start to make it a global uh, education rather than per country. Thank you, Dr. Um, so uh, real quick about the program and it kind of very similar between uh, the TEA program and the TGC program. TGC program we started off with uh, online curriculum. We took uh, what was uh, cool into eight college credits worth of uh, material and uh, it was a pretty intense program giving us techniques for use in the classroom as well as kind of changing our mindsets. And from there we had a symposium last February where we got together with all the different people traveling uh, regardless which country they were going to. Uh, that's when I got to meet my uh, cohort members that were traveling to India. And in July I had uh, hopped on a plane and spent uh, nearly three weeks in the country of India, which was amazing. And once all of that was complete, I came back and we, uh, uh, well, we, I created a international education guide uh, that I, I'm, you'll see my website later to share it. Um, so both of them, again, focus on providing workshops to help teachers get better and to get a better understanding of this international culture. Um, and while both while in the country of India and while the TEA fellows will be here, there'll be workshops or I went through workshops learning about the Indian culture, learning about the Indian education system. I did some cultural excursions, visiting places like the Taj Mahal, and I'm going to show some pictures in a moment, and then getting field experience. I spent some time, um, a whole week, working with one teacher in their particular school and really getting an understanding of how their education system works. Uh, so of, I went to India. Um, uh, my first part of the trip I spent in Delhi. Um, that is the capital of India. Uh, it's a big bustling city and uh, I got to meet some very influential education leaders uh, including the National Director of Education and had an amazing lunch with him and we talked about uh, different philosophies that the different countries have in education. Uh, and we visited some of the schools there in the city. After that, I traveled to Kozakoti, um, uh, which is in the state of Kerala, where I spent a week with a host teacher. Uh, he was amazing. He actually came to UMass Lowell uh, three years ago, two years ago, um, two years ago, and he did his TEA uh, experience here. He was in Tewksbury, but we won't hold that against him. Um, <laughs> and then from there, uh, we traveled to Agra, which is – uh, famous for the Taj Mahal. Uh, we did a wrap up of our experiences trying to bring what is a very powerful experience together um, and begin work on our um, moving back to our, our own country. Uh, one thing that drives home uh, my experience in India is this phrase, Atiti Divo Bhava, which means guest is God. And while I was there, they made me feel that way. Um, at no point did I ever feel like I was anything less than the most amazing person in the world. Um, so, Dr. Lang, if you. So, uh, going there when I visited Delhi, uh, it's an amazing city. Uh, we got to visit some of the schools. The, the picture on the left is my cohort of friends, uh, lifelong friends now, um, that I got to experience it with. Uh, the guy in the front is one of our hosts, uh, Rajesh. And they took us through the city. We got to see the good, the bad of Delhi, and there's a, a lot of both. Um, they took us outside of the city to a little village, which um, if it, it's, it was amazing, this little village. And that's a picture of it on the bottom right. It's okay. And we got to experience a lot of the culture. But once we walked in that little village, which maybe had a population of about 50, uh, they swarmed us for the entire time we were there. And... Every, everything they could show us, they tried to. Uh, we get to they, they put us on an ox cart and dragged us through the city and celebrating and singing the entire way. It was, it was like a mini parade, uh, which was awesome. Um, after um, that little village visit, we also get to visit some of the schools. We get to see some of the best and brightest of the students uh, India had to offer in some of their, uh, those schools. As you can see, their amazing yoga talent in the right. 
Um, there's the uh, district, uh, not district, the uh, director of education for the nation there talking to the teachers and the students. He was amazing. He, he fielded some challenging questions that the teachers had about uh, classroom choice and those type of things. And he took it all and he went with it. And um, it, was, it was really amazing to see. Uh, the schools are very different than what we have here. Everything's, there's, it's, I would describe it like you would think a California school, no hallways, everything's kind of outdoors. There's no doors on the classrooms. Um, the, the education style is very different as well. Uh, it, it's a lot more, what are you gonna do to get me to pass this test? And it's not teaching the, the student the whole meaning of being a human. It's if you wanna get a better life, you have to pass the test, memorize everything I tell you which is unfortunate, and they are trying to make changes to it, and I think that's where this relationship that, I'm, that I've built with my fellow teachers is coming along, and, but it's, a, it's, it's countrywide, and so it's gonna take a while. So um, visited those schools in Delhi, um, high schools, elementary, they were, they were all amazing. The kids put on amazing performances every time we walked in, and they always fed us. Food, every, everywhere we went, there was meals. Um, some of the cultural places in Delhi, uh, I get to see Red Fort, which was a, um, a monstrous fort that uh, from the 14s, 1500s, uh, all the way up to the 1700s, it was an active fort. I get to see some of their uh, religious places like uh, Akshadam, which is the bottom left, and some of their amazing, uh, beautiful images the kids would create. That, that's all made with uh, le uh, flower petals, that picture in the middle. Mm. And they would do that on the front hallway as you walk into the school for every school that we went into it may have been just for us i don't know if it's there every day but they're gorgeous and everyone's a little different um, but there's also the unfortunate part that not everybody is economically advantaged the upper right th those are houses that you see there behind that pipe they're basically whatever pieces of scrap they can find to build a house and they just create these vast areas that are just cardboard and tarps and metal bits that they use to make houses and it's unfortunate that a lot of those kids end up um, in unfortunate situations uh, we actually by accident but it actually worked out nicely ended up seeing a, a youth prison um, and got to see some of these kids that because they have no opportunity to get to go to school and get everything that um, we have the luxury of ha here in the U US these kids are ending in life of crime at the age of six so it's, it was a little tragic, um, but it was, it was eye-opening in many different ways. Uh, traveling down to Kodoko, as, as it's pronounced there, um, I, walking into the school, they had an amazing presentation for us. Every school, regardless where we went, had an amazing presentation. Uh, students performing uh, their traditional dances and songs and um, we get an opportunity when we were in Kodoko to talk and actually teach some of these students, uh, which was really cool. Um, some of them had not seen, a, the, or will probably never see an American again. And uh, getting to, they, they swarm you. It's like locusts on honey. They just come after you and they just want to talk with you and meet you. And uh, every opportunity they go to, I was taking selfies. So I got, I'm now the selfie king. Um, Nice long arms, it helps. They made you a sign. Yeah, they made us banner. There's, there's probably about 20 of those plastered around the school. Wow, that's cool. Um, just to warn you, I'm planning on trying to get one printed for when our guests come in to the TEA. Uh, this has inspired me. We're gonna, I'm going to mention some things later. Um, but we get to teach uh, different classes. I get to see um, some 10th graders, 11th graders, and 12th graders. And uh, this is a very important time in their life. Um, this is where they decide if they're going to go down to college. They have to take an exam at the end of their 11th grade, at the end of their 12th grade. If they fail the exam, they're not going to college. Sort of like our SATs and ACTs, but this, yeah, you can't retake it. And failing is anything lower than a 98%. Wow. Wow. So that's because all is so competitive to get into these schools that the, the, the kids have no choice but to be perfect and uh, amazing kids. Uh, and unfortunately, many of them are also weeded out before they get to 11th and 12th because they just won't be able to hack it in the class. And we actually had um, 
we got to see some other political things. There was a political issue where the students actually went on protest. High school students went on protest, and bottom right picture, some of them are standing there yelling and screaming, and uh, they're very peaceful about it, but they're very loud um, and interrupting classes of those that were still trying to learn. Uh, and uh, this, a picture of the school we, we were at is there on the um, bottom left. The yellow building is actually the high school, and the white building is the construction of a college. Um, so, uh, it rains a lot, <laughs> a lot. Um, if you weren't paying attention to the news, they had the worst monsoons they've had in years. Um, and it gets very wet. Um, so everything washes away. As I was there, I also got to visit some historical and cultural sites. Uh, the Western Ghat Mountains is a beautiful, lush, um, mountain range. Was, I don't know how to describe it. It's so amazing. The mountains just climb really quickly and go up uh, easily 5,000 feet real quick. And everything's covered in a, a lush jungle. Um, get to see the uh, Indian Ocean. Uh, the upper right-hand corner, I get to see the Etical Caves, which are 6,000-year-old cave drawings or carvings. Uh, that is a sun god king um, in that picture, if you can make it out. And we got to see some fun wildlife. We went through a tiger reserve. Didn't get to see a good tiger, but we got to see the elephants and their wild habitat and boars and lots and lots and lots of deer. And um, So it was an amazing trip. Uh, coming back uh, to Agra, we, we learned more cultural experiences beyond uh, that. We got to see some traditional, uh, what's called the raga, which is kind of like an Indian opera. It goes on for several it took about two hours before they were finally done the first song. Uh, they fed us the entire time. It was a lot of fun. Um, I did some shopping, and of course we saw the Taj Mahal, uh, which is amazing. You should all go. Um, so what some of the things we learned is there's a, a lot of similarities, but there are some differences. Um, we all have to meet high demands of uh, education as determined by government. Uh, and I think we do a great job here in the U.S. Uh, of not only following the, the curriculum as stated, but meeting those other things that aren't necessarily written down, like how to be a good person and how to interact with others. And I, I think that's something that all teachers desire to do, but in India they seemed a little bit more handcuffed to the curriculum to the point where I attended a PTO meeting and some of the parents got mad that... Uh, the other partner teacher and I were there because the kids weren't learning what was line two of the syllabus on that day and said we don't want these teachers here and so the principal said we're having them anyways so it was nice to have that support there um, so balancing the demand of the needs of the students and uh, and real life is a challenge regardless where we go and having the resources necessary Chelmsford is amazing I am so grateful that I teach here um, the classroom I visited had a blackboard and just rows of benches no, and no lights. They had just received a grant that they were installing projector, uh, overhead projectors, but there's no computers for the projectors. So they are very limited on their resources. And uh, I'm very grateful for everything I have in my classroom, teaching biotechnology, there's thousands of dollars worth of equipment through grants and et cetera. But having that opportunity to teach the students, I'm very appreciative of what we have in Chelmsford. All teachers have a passion. And um, it, it was very evident that these teachers cared about their students. Uh, they do lunch with them um, to kind of catch up and make sure they're doing well and eating well at times. Uh, and it, it's, it's an appreciation for uh, our students I think that's really what drives teachers and another big thing I learned is the culture um, in India it, the culture is this is business get it done here in Chelmsford we have so much we offer the students and the culture here is amazing whether it's our activities and our sports and uh, I can't uh, it, it gave me a huge appreciation going over there for what we have here in Chelmsford uh, so it, it's I, I thank you for that um, Let's, uh, let's see, next slide. Um, so my big takeaway, I had to create a, uh, a final conclusion on this. And my question going in is, what does, 
what effect does culture have on science and education? And I walked in going, well, how does religion have effect? How does um, the, the social stigmas of, uh, they, well, they technically don't have the caste system there anymore, it's still present. And how do those type of things affect the education? How does uh, the government affect the education? And there, there are a lot of similarities, and um, I could spend hours talking about that. Uh, and you can, and I'll share my global education guide link with you in a moment. Uh, and that, if you want, you can go ahead and read that. And there's lots of <coughs> so this whole idea of Aditi B, Devo Bhava, a, a guest is God. They made me feel like that when I was there, and I'm planning on sharing that with our TEA fellows as they come in. Um, so. Uh, as Dr. Hirsch mentioned, we're going to be learning who our uh, hosts are this Thursday, and then the following Thursday we get to meet them. And finally, on February 4th, we're going to be hosting our TEA fellows at Chumsford High School. And every school I went into, they threw a big welcoming ceremony. And uh, uh, our, our, the five members of this year's Chumsford High cohort, uh, we've plan we're planning one of those as well. And we'd like to invite all of you. Uh, it's going to be nice, bright, and early, 719 in the morning on the 4th. Um, and we'd love to have you come and greet people. Um, we will have five, ho uh, five international fellows. Don't know what countries they are from yet, um, but uh, this could run the gamut from Cameroon to Ghana to India to uh, uh, all over the world. So uh, we'd love for you to come and greet them. Uh, we're going to try to get some of their performing groups, uh, maybe the a cappella groups or the <coughs> band to uh, welcome them as well. And um, if any of you want to say a little welcome, we'd love to have you participate in that. Feel free to email me. Um, and then some of the things we're going to do, of course, they're going to be visiting for uh, five weeks on Mondays. Uh, and feel free to stop in on any of those days if you ever want to chat with them. They, they have amazing stories. These are some of the top teachers in the world. Um, my hosts, um, while I was in India, one of them was recognized as the National Teacher of the Year this past year. We were so excited for her. Um, and these are the kind of people that are coming over to us to learn how to become more uh, accessible for the students and uh, to improve their own education. So uh, if they're treating us as one of the marks to follow, it's amazing. Um, we're going to be hosting lunches and socials during the school so the students can interact with them, not necessarily in the classroom, and we can reach out to those students who don't have the five teachers. Uh, they will be back, I believe, the schedule says March 5th for the school committee? Yes. So, okay, good. I'm glad I got that right. Uh, so they will be coming to visit you as well then. Um, and then uh, we're looking at possibly visiting elementary classrooms, uh, getting them out of just the high school to see some of the other schools and uh, get them to experience all the amazing things Chumster has to offer. So, um, my website and blog that ha is my global education guide where you can learn about my teaching philosophy and how it's changed because of this global visit. Um, and you can read my whole blog of my entire trip. So if you have like a spare three or four hours to read, um, but there's uh, more, more amazing pictures. So please feel free to visit that. Anybody have any questions? Yes. Coming back to your classrooms in Chelmsford after yes. having spent this period in India, did you re do you recognize, aha, now I understand how this student learns? Did you see a history, you know, you could make sense of their educational history because of your trip? So, yes. So uh, there are students who you're talking, students have come from yes. other countries. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, very much so. I, I've, uh, I, I see things that I wouldn't have picked up on before. That's um, fascinating. It, isn't it? It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and, and my goal is beyond what I've learned is to share this with my students. I've already started changing my curriculum, especially my environmental science class, to making kids think about what is this world problem and how can we fix it, what water quality or yeah. energy use or those type of things. So. Uh, hoping to kind of grab those kids who have those experiences that I'm like, ah, I see you. Right. And it must get make them, them so proud oh, yeah. for you to have had such a positive experience and bring that back to the classroom and share it. Oh, uh, yes. Thank you. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. So what's the, um, the traditional 
Okay. Anywhere. So I'm. <laughs> India is a very big country, just like the U.S. Sure. Yeah. And I'm uh, wearing the traditional formal gear or uh, formal wear of the state of Kerala. If India is shaped kind of like an upside down hand. Mm -hmm. Delhi's up near the middle, and Kerala is down near the bottom tip. And it's hot. <laughs> When I was there, it didn't drop below 98 degrees, and the humidity was never below 75 percent. So, it was hot, <laughs> and they wear. Uh, this is called a dhoti. It's kind of a, a fancy skirt. This is the formal one. They have one called a longi, which is brightly colored. The dhotis are white with a gold stripe. Oh no, um, stay standing. <laughs> would you like? I can. Yeah, we'll get it better. For okay. You. I, I'm wearing pants now because it's very cold here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, they were uh, typically teachers would wear a button down shirt like this and a, a dhoti uh, to teach. There's uh, things you can do with the skirt to flip it up and make it more comfortable and easier to walk in, but I'm not going to demonstrate that here. <laughs> uh, how are teachers viewed over there? Uh, uh, they're respected, they, or are they just there to do a job and get the kids to the next level? That's a great question. It depends on where you are. <clears throat> um, Many of them are respected. Um, they're not put up on pillars, um, but they're not, it's not the premier job, but it's a good job. Uh, a lot of, uh, we got to visit a, um, a school uh, that was training teachers. The, one of their biggest challenges, you can get your teaching certification after a year in college. And that's, there's, n yep, you get one year, and some of the classes are, how do you make a model out of clay? And while that's a, that would be really cool to learn for my class, that doesn't get into the how to engage a student, how to reach out, and so that's some of the challenges there. Um, but it's, they're, they're recognized as being an important part of the community, but they're not a, yeah. Kind Not of a, a prestigious job. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, is it just coincidental that both you and Linda are side teachers, or are they looking for side teachers for this program? It is amazing it? that Chumster got more than one teacher. Okay. Um, there were uh, over 400 applicants from the U.S., and 70 uh, of us were chosen. And uh, when people started realizing we were both from the same school, some of you, even the people that were making the decisions was like, oh, interesting. So it, it doesn't happen that we're both – the. It, random chance yeah so they teach from all fields yes. uh, in these programs and in fact actually i was originally waitlisted, and i found out sometime mid-september that I, uh, not this past year but the previous year that i was put in and they were already two weeks into the, the that really intense college course and i had a lot of catching up to do <laughs> so can you just talk you said uh they treated you really respectfully oh, yes. and they held you to, to a um I don't know if you said on a platform a type thing, yeah. but can you explain a little bit about that? Like what? So uh, um, every time you show up to a place, they give you the bindi, which is the uh, uh, the mark they put on your forehead. To uh, it's a sign of utmost respect. They give you lays when they walk in. Everybody, they're throwing flower petals on the ground where you're walking. Uh, food, lots of food. They treat you to a banquet every time you walked into a building, um, and they always went out of their way to make you feel like you were amazing. So they would give up on any of their own things just to make sure that you were um, having the best time you could ever have. It was uh, that consistent throughout your throughout the, Wherever I was and whenever we went somewhere, it was that way. So people just, they would do anything they could to make you feel like you were amazing. Anybody else, Donna? You said that the uh, top tier kids um, have the opportunity to move on in their education. What yep. happens to the kids who uh, don't A school? lot of them will go find jobs um, or... Have a technical training for them or... <sighs> Not really. Okay. Um, a lot of it becomes hands-on. I'm going to go find a plumber to... Well, they don't really have plumbing. Um, but they'll go find somebody to kind of apprentice under um, or figure out some way to help out the family. Um, whether it's gardening or working in a store, yeah, there's not a not a whole lot of training for those who finish high school but don't move on to college. Okay. Um, those that do move on to college, it's 100% free, all the way through PhD. Just one thing you said 
before they get to like 11th and 12th grade, you had mentioned, I mean, they've actually like weeded children out of the school system entirely. Yeah. So in the school I was, um, in the school I was in at 10th grade, they kind of like, all right, you're not going to be able to cut it in 11th and 12th. You might want to go consider doing other things. So, yeah. yeah. 11th and 12th grade are almost like a junior college. So it's like some real Hunger Games stuff right there. I, I'd say probably maybe 20 or 30 percent of the kids end up dropping out at that 10th grade and not moving on to 11th and 12th. They still get like a completion after 10th grade, like a sort right, of like but, a, but they don't. They've actually moved people out of the, there's people gone out of the school system. Yep. That's incredible. Okay. It makes you appreciate our system. Oh, I, yes. I'm a fan. That's why I participate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anybody have anything else? Did you notice, um, other than the uh, college application, for, you know, test, yep. is testing a big part of their system? Yes. Yeah. That's part of the reason they figure out how to weed people out. It's, it's a... From, from elementary school Elementary. Uh, um, elementary, not so much. Elementary, they're, they're just very closer to what we have here for elementary. But once they heart, uh, start hitting those later years, it becomes... I'm going to lecture, you're going to listen, you're going to study at home, you're going to take a test. Okay. And the test, you fail the test, it was nice knowing you. Okay. you. You'll find in many of the countries that there's comprehensive exams, and they usually start with what would be what we consider sixth grade here. Yep. And that helps them decide what, like what class next school yep. they're going to go to sometimes. Because yeah. some, some areas like... Um, yeah, it helps determine which school. So uh, one of the schools I visited uh, in Delhi was the top school. And that's the one you saw the director of education because that's his pride and joy. Um, and you had to get like a perfect score and have excellent marks and have a rich parents to get into that school. And then there's other lesser schools that you could still go through and still do pretty well. It's kind of a, a tiered school system. What kinds of things did they want to find out about this place? <laughs> there are lots of good questions. Um, <laughs> there was one school I visited. They, they wanted to know all about our curriculum and all about teachers and how we interacted. And then there was other ones that are like, what's the food like? Do you all eat? Um, they all thought we ate Chinese food for lunch. I'm like, um, it's no. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. Um, so they want to know about the food and uh, what some of the activities that the students would do. Um, I brought along with me some slides sharing uh, some of the great activities Chumpster High does, and um, they would ask questions about those. It, it, um, the questions varied. Do they have misconceptions from movies? From movies? They have movies. <laughs> um, so uh, there were there we were. I ask, and sometimes you get yeah. questions about cowboys yeah. and guns. We got guns. Yeah, we have guns, yeah. but. Um, yeah, there's a lot of misconceptions out yeah. there. I mean, even the T yeah. fellows that came last year, they did not believe that we had American flags in our in our mm -hmm. classes. They thought that we made that up. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, they were like, you guys really do, and you yeah. stand up and you do the Pledge of Allegiance. So they don't understand some of the, the nuances that happen. Same with us. We don't understand. Mm -hmm. That's part of the even the T program is the first thing they do is they educate everyone on to how to handle each of the cultural differences. Like, you may not be able to shake someone's hand. You may not be yeah. able to be in the same room as someone without another female in the room there's all sorts of things so you have to go through those cultural pieces before you can even get to the educational piece I did have someone propose to me you did? Interesting. Yeah. a high school kid I was a little weirded out right. by that one but <laughs> <laughs> you said no right yeah <laughs> very happily married yes. yeah. <laughs> well thank you very much for thank hearing you. your uh, yeah. experience thank, thank, you. thank you for thank coming you. tonight Anyone with that presentation? <laughs> presentation number four. Uh, so we actually have Bill Silver, our uh, technology director, and um, I know there's uh, staff and parents <laughs> in the district as well. Bill is going to provide us with a, um, uh, excuse me, he's going to provide us with a little update on technology. And as you know, we've been talking a lot this fall um, and as the school year started about um, supporting a one-on-one -on -one computer initiative within the district. So uh, there's been a committee that Bill is going to talk about that's done a lot of work over the course of the year on that. And um, I'm not going to uh, take too much of his presentation, but uh, invite Bill to, uh, to share with us what's happening in technology and within that recommendation. Okay. 
Thank you, Dr. Lang. Uh, school committee, thank you for <coughs> allowing us, uh, me to present tonight. All right, so uh, I have a few slides for you. Uh, I'm gonna give you a brief update from uh, basically the summertime through present, and then I wanna talk to you a little bit about the one-to-one uh, -one steering committee that we formed and uh, some of the outcomes from that group. Uh, this summer, I told you that uh, we were looking at upgrading all the infrastructure to all of the different buildings. Um, and we actually have finally finished that. It, it's all complete. Um, all six schools that were not uh, that were not prior uh, previously finished are now finished. The town capital funded our McCarthy, Harrington, and Center School, and then we did get a grant from the state for about six hundred and thirty-four thousand that did the CHS, Byam, and Self Throw. Uh, so now we have all new switching. We have all new wireless and all new fiber connections. Uh, in every single one of our schools. And uh, it seems like everything's been working fantastically. We have not had any complaints about it. Um, wireless devices uh, now have the capacity to run at wired speeds. And, uh, you know, last year at this time, I think I was telling you about how we had to shut kids' wireless access off at the high school and things like that. Uh, no longer a concern. Uh, we can load that load that thing up with as many devices as we want and it will still chug along. Um, another piece that we uh, put in place this year, as you know, all MCAS testing has to be done online. Um, so obviously we needed a lot more devices to be able to allow that to happen within the testing window. Uh, so CHS, McCarthy, and Parker all just received uh, 10 new Chromebook carts. All the elementaries just received uh, five additional Chromebook carts. Um, so that will definitely allow us to finish all the testing within the window. And uh, I saw an email from one of the middle schools and they went from testing around 27 days down to 11 days. Uh, and you know, hopefully with the, the start of a one-to-one -one initiative, we can actually get that down to around four days in the future. Um, and that's a huge difference. Now a building doesn't have to be on basically shut down the whole time uh, everyone's testing. We can kind of bang it out and move on with, uh, with our curriculum. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to get into the steering committee uh, section of the presentation. Uh, the steering committee uh, was made up of 24 participants. We had administrators, teachers, tech staff, integration specialists, uh, student support, uh, union representation, parents, basically every stakeholder group um, that you would want to include in making decisions about uh, implementing a large-scale one-to-one initiative uh, were part of this committee. And uh, at the end of the committee, basically, we have generated a, a comprehensive document. Um, that will be more of a reference guide for administrators, teachers, students, and parents. Uh, and the guidelines that we follow are actually uh, uh, ISTE topics. And, you know, one-to-one -one initiatives aren't something that are brand new. Uh, we're not the first district to embark on something like this. So, uh, obviously, there are some things that uh, successful initiatives have shown, and these are the topics that we followed. These, are, these were the topics that we covered. Uh, obviously, we needed a shared vision uh, so that we were all on the same page about what we were trying to accomplish with the one-to-one uh, -one initiative. And then things like equitable access, uh, adequate funding, uh, personnel and tech support, empowered leaders, professional learning, <coughs> uh, inst instructional framework for curriculum, student-centered learning, uh, feedback and evaluation, engaged communities, and then the policies that go along with those. And I'm gonna take you through each one of these pieces as quickly as I can. 
Um, probably in your packet. <coughs> I won't read you the whole thing, but there's a copy of our, our shared vision. Um, you know, and this probably was, it's one of the main components of the work the committee did um, because it's really where you state everything that you want you want to want initiative to be about or uh, even technology in general to be to be about in the district so this took several weeks to actually craft uh, and and we went back and forth and everyone uh, had good input into this and I feel like at the end of the day uh, the group really came up with something uh, that was valuable and will really drive the one-to-one -one implementation All right, and this uh, document, I think you probably also got a copy of the entire uh, document. That'll go up online for you know everyone to be able to uh, to see. Uh, and each one of these sections probably has you know a page to four pages of various information. So I'll just give you the highlights. The equitable access uh, component is the idea that every member of the organization has access to the technology that will make them successful. Uh, all schools, like I just talked about, have an enhanced infrastructure. All schools have robust Wi-Fi. All schools have high-speed internet access, and that'll also be something that we're looking to upgrade this summer. Um, and all schools have access to digital resources for learning. And you know, with the upgrades to the infrastructure, uh, it put us you know, a couple years ahead of schedule. Uh, we originally, I, I thought we probably wouldn't be at this point where we could deliver a one-to-one -one implementation, uh, probably until 2021, 2022. Um, but we're we're ahead of the curve now, and all of these things are available to uh, every staff member, every student. Uh, for consistent and adequate funding, uh, obviously this is an investment. Um, it's going to be a substantial yearly expenditure, uh, but it's an important yearly expenditure. Um, superintendent has identified the school choice revolving fund as a place that can adequately fund our initiative. Uh, so this is kind of a basic breakdown. It's, uh, it's an estimate based on some pricing models uh, that I've got this year, um, where we'd stage this in over a four-year period First year, we'd uh, implement Chromebooks to grades five and grades, grade nine students. That would cost us uh, around $56,000. And we would do that exact same thing for four years uh, and just keep leasing those devices. So at the end of four years, you'd have a full implementation from five to 12, grades five to 12, uh, with a sustained cost of about $225,000 a year to do that. Now, is that just devices? Does it include repair and upkeep? And That's just devices. The plan um, that we discussed with the steering committee, there are some things we definitely can repair on Chromebooks, but <coughs> we're not talking about $1,000 laptops. These are like $250 devices. So there's some things that it's just not worth it to repair. Just to get the part, uh, you could almost replace the device for. So uh, our plan will be to lease uh, an additional amount to what uh, the actual student population is, and then we'll go with a, a practice of just a swap out. And if we can fix the unit that we got back, we'll certainly do that. And if it's beyond repair, then we'll, we'll lose that unit. When you talk about um, the 225000 as being for the devices, Will that include everything that's going to go on in terms of what the kids will need in order to be able to effectively use it in the classroom? Yeah, well, that's the beauty of um, the Chrome devices. We really, there are no applications to be installed on it. Um, everything is basically browser-based. There are some extensions and, you know, there are some apps uh, like you see for phones and things that you can install. The vast majority of them are free. Um, and the students will only be allowed to install the ones that we approve for in, uh, installation. So basically anything they need can be accomplished with just that device. And just a quick follow-up to that. Um, would that include things like, um, I know that there's some um, music software that kids need for homework. Would that include that, or would that be something separate that we would have to... That would likely be something separate, but, um, you know, however they're accessing that today, if they're accessing it online, if it's in an online format, 
the Chromebook can access. I think parents it. have to purchase it at this point, um, so I didn't know if we would be including it as just uh, part of what we do, or something that parents would still be required to purchase. Yeah, if if uh, parents presently are uh, spending on a specialty software, they would continue to buy that okay. specialty software. Right. And things like graphic arts classes and things like that—that that would all would we have to do anything special for the, you know that for their devices? So uh, a lot of the graphics art classes utilize the Mac platform. Okay. They'll still need to utilize that in their classroom. Okay. Uh, you know, but there's only a few of those labs at the high school really that uh, it's being utilized in. So for basically everything else, the Chromebook would suffice. Yeah, these are more general purpose, right? They're not mm -hmm. specialty. Right. Yeah. You know, okay. we, we could, I'm sure, run a virtual environment to allow some of that software to run. and. You know, we're looking at that uh, in regards to like engineering software and things like that. So it's something that could develop in the future. Mm -hmm. Out of the gates, we're going to just. All right, I think that actually, the, I think the way he just put it, probably I didn't get that piece. So it's a much more general type of. Right. Mm -hmm. okay. Like for homework right. and email. Okay. And right. Thank right. you. All right. Thank you. Good. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. <coughs> All right. Uh, skilled personnel and tech support. <coughs> Uh, so obviously, if you're going to enter into a one-to-one -one deployment, um, you need a great amount of technical support and very skilled staff. Um, right now, we have four integration specialists, several of whom are, are here, uh, to assist users with the best practice integration techniques. Um, three of these uh, work in the uh, proposed one-to-one -one initiative grade levels. Uh, so basically, we have three people uh, across the 5 to 12 spectrum uh, that can support teachers on a one-to-one -one basis and help them uh, integrate technology into their curriculum. Um, we also have a tech director, a network admin, a service manager, a solutions engineer, and three technicians. Um, so I feel like we're well-staffed to roll this out and kind of take on uh, the tickets and see where we stand at the end of that, but I, I believe we uh, we have what it, it takes to get it out there and off the ground. Uh, power leadership is uh, one of the key components, and this was a section that we asked the uh, the principals really to take a close look at. Um, so the whole idea of a one to one initiative is that we're going to put devices in teachers' hands and in kids' hands. And we're going to ask them to kind of change what's been happening in the classroom and to take risks and do different things that engage students uh, and, you know, grab their interest and keep it. And, uh, you know, similar to what you just heard from Brian a few minutes ago, to not uh, just stand and, and lecture and then test, but to have kids have choice in their education and have kids participate actively in their education. That's going to look very different in a number of different classrooms, and it's going to take time for teachers to get the hang of it and for students to get the hang of it. So during that time, uh, we want to make sure that the proper supports are in place and that uh, everyone is an empowered leader. So that goes for central office supporting principals, principals supporting teachers in their classrooms, and right down to teachers. Um, really supporting students as they embark on, on this one-to-one uh, -one as well. <coughs> uh, ongoing professional learning is a key component to this uh, initiative. And this is probably the one that, you know, obviously uh, teachers were very concerned about. Um, they want to make sure that they have the skill set built so that they can deliver the, the quality instruction that we know that they can deliver uh, using technology. So this is something where, you know, we don't just give them one PD class and then sort of turn them loose. We'll continue to uh, skill build. We've been doing it for a few years, offering various professional development uh, courses. We've now implemented a graduate level blended learning class. Um, and then our TIS group has made uh, all kinds of different self-paced uh, Google classes for teachers that they can, you know, they can take uh, at their own, uh, on their own time, at their own pace. Um, and then we'll obviously still use things like half day, 
PD and then uh, meetings with our TIS and, and you know, small group instruction um, to continue to the skill build with teachers. Uh, in addition to that, um, because like I said, we had many stakeholder groups on the steering committee, uh, it also was brought, brought up during these meetings that parents are gonna need some of this type of training as well. Um, so we're gonna have similar classes available, self-paced classes available to parents. Uh, they'll be able to sign up and uh, take the same things that teachers will. And uh, we'll also have face-to-face -face sessions with them, uh, you know, before we do any deployment. So this summer, prior to the, sc the school year starting, we'll, um, we'll have some training sessions for parents. All right. Uh, the instructional framework for curriculum. So this basically talks about, um, you know, we'll have these devices, then what do we do with them? So uh, basically U UDL, the Universal Design for Learning, uh, we can implement all of those best practices uh, with a one-to-one -one initiative. Uh, data, I think, is going to become much more available for administrators and teachers so that they can review it and then make adjustments to their curriculum and instruction. Uh, blended and student-centered learning, uh, something that we've been working on, uh, you know, probably in education for years, but having a one-to-one -one initiative really opens a lot of doorways for that uh, and, and really makes it more powerful in the classroom. And teachers who have have taken our blended learning course now, uh, they, you know, some of the strategies that they've been able to implement, uh, you know, they can't stop talking about. And, you know, it's this whole idea of really uh, grouping kids with similar skill sets, being able to work, you know, with five or six kids at once while other kids are working at their own pace on other things. And taking the classroom basically from 23, 24 kids down to like a five on one uh, really allows teachers to, to get through a lot of material and really make sure that kids understand it. At the same time, kids are uh, working on things that are important to them or they have choice in. Uh, you know, they might want to be on the IXL program, they might want to be researching uh, further something that they learned in class, but they have the ability to do that uh, in a student centered classroom. And then uh, finally, we'll have a common platform to deliver course content, and that will be Google Classroom. Uh, it's one thing I've heard a lot of from parents uh, and from teachers that uh, they're, they feel like there's too many places that they need to go to figure out what's happening sometimes in class. And this will give our teachers one place to put all of their materials, and uh, parents will have one place to check to see you know, exactly what's coming up in class. Student-centered learning, I uh, just touched on it uh, there, but uh, this is the belief that learning moves uh, students from passive receivers um, to active participants. What students learn, how they learn it, and how they're learning as assessed are all driven by each individual student's needs and abilities. Uh, and technology use is always guided by two criteria, what's appropriate for the task at hand and how can activities be designed to develop higher order thinking skills. And again, this isn't a, a new philosophy, but it's going to, going to actually allow us to uh, implement this type of classroom uh, by, by having a one-to-one -one initiative. The feedback and evaluation component, uh, obviously you have to assess what you're putting out there and figure out if it's working, if it's not working, what components are working. Um, so that's gonna be a crucial piece. And the way that uh, the steering committee decided we should do this is to survey uh, teachers, survey students, survey parents, and survey administrators uh, through uh, Google Forms. And these are things that uh, we actually need to build. So my hope was next year during some of the professional development time uh, with the fifth and ninth grade teachers, 
uh, that some of that will be used for actually building out some of the question sets because then they'll have an idea of what they've seen and what they want, what do they really need to learn or hear for feedback to evaluate uh, what the one-to-one -one implementation has, has achieved or not achieved. Uh, engage communities. To realize the full value of uh, technology, educators need support from families and the community. Families require information and education, so uh, you know we were lucky to have uh, uh, several parent uh, participants on the steering committee, and they were able to bring back questions that they were hearing uh, from other parents and fr um, from PTOs, and uh, this is how we we decided that we would provide some type of uh, training program for parents. Um, the other things that came from the steering committee were that we'll address parent questions and concerns, and as we receive questions or, or we answer these questions, we'll create a, fac a frequently asked questions page on the website so that they can go and see you know, other questions that have been asked. Maybe they uh, have something similar and they can see uh, a lot of Q&A on a frequently asked uh, questions page. Uh, again, we'll offer education which parallels the skill building being offered to staff. Um, and then, you know, some of the questions that came in um, during the steering committee was, you know, what happens if a parent doesn't want a child to be on a device? You know, uh, so these were things that the steering committee needed to make decisions on. Uh, you know, and the, and the decision was sometimes a parent is not going to want a student on a device, and that's okay. They can still come, learn, and uh, participate in class, and they don't have to be on a device that particular day. Uh, what happens if a student doesn't remember to bring their device? Um, I don't know any kids that ever forget anything at home. Uh, at least mine never have. <laughs> Uh, so if a student doesn't remember to bring their device, we'll have some loaners available in the library. Uh, you know, things like how can we be sure families will have internet access? Uh, in our documentation, there are, uh, there are resources for, for parents. Anyone who's uh, uh, eligible for free and reduced lunch, they can go to Comcast, they can get internet for $9 a month, and all the guidelines on how to apply for it are there for them. Uh, so again, the, the committee put a tremendous amount of work into sort of listening to, to feedback, listening to various questions, and then trying to find solutions to them. And a lot of that is in the, uh, the long documentation that uh, will be available to everybody. Uh, and then finally, the protocol and policies. This is probably one of the most important components because this is what, this is how we, uh, describe to parents and students how we want them to behave with the devices and what our expectations are and then what happens if expectations are not met. Um, so it goes for everything from the expectations for use in school, use outside of school, the care of the devices, uh, appropriate use of audio and video recording functions, uh, you know, network connectivity, student safety, uh, parent responsibilities, loss, loss and theft, uh, and then there's a, an agreement that parents and students will sign off on. So uh, that has the language that the steering committee felt comfortable putting together. I know that um, the admin staff still wants to go through that. Ultimately, that will come back to you to, uh, to take a vote on. Have you considered the, the school committee policies also that are in these areas? Because we did we do all our policies and there's some things on digital media and everything else in those. Yeah, so they'll, um, this, this document will actually reference a lot of the policies that the school committee has. So it'll, it'll tell them this is the expectation and here's where you see the explanation of that expectation. Uh, finally, you know, I just want to thank all the participants. You know, there are 24 people that were involved in this that, uh, uh, this has been ongoing since October. Uh, several meetings, a lot of offline work. Um, we collaborated over Google quite a bit. Uh, and I think this was some real thorough work, and I think that uh, what we presented is, uh, uh, you know, the beginnings of a very successful one-to-one -one implementation. Uh, this will 
this is a, a good foundation. It's a good starting point. And none of this is ever going to be, uh, you know, set in stone. Everything is going to, to change. It's going to be modified as we start the program and we see, you know, what works well, what doesn't work well, some things that we, you know, we thought we had answered properly, but we needed to uh, come back and take a look at. Uh, so it'll always be pretty fluid, uh, but I believe we have a good starting point here. Just to jump in for a second before there's any questions and discussion, I think um, what we talked over the summer and then heading into the fall about the initiative, um, you know, we really kind of gave the um, bill on the steering committee just some general kind of uh, outline. You know, we'd really like to see um, a one-on-one -on -one type initiative. Uh, I think we have the funding to be able to support that. I think that is a step, <coughs> bless you, okay. that the district um, could and should take as far as getting more technology in the hands of our students doing it. You know, I was very happy that we we're going to be able to recommend doing this at two grade levels and just instead of one financially. Um, so there was just kind of a shell to work from. But the group really put a tremendous amount of time going through this project, um, coming up with the proposal. Again, the document itself is more um, comprehensive than um, the PowerPoint presentation. It's a good, you know, it's, it's a good 40-page document. Bill is nice enough to put that into some overarching slides. Um, but there's a significant amount of work that was done. Um, and there's, as he, Bill says, there's still more to come because as we actually implement and roll an, an initiative like this out, we're going to learn things about it. And I think, again, similar to some of the discussions we've had around even security implementation, where you're not doing it all at the same time, you know, what you learn from year one, we're going to want to modify and come back and make improvements for year two before you roll it out. Um, but I think it's significant. I, I'm very excited about this. I appreciate the work um, Bill and the staff and uh, parents and all the volunteers on the um, on the committee did to, to bring this um, to bring this to you. So I'd love to have um, you know some input and some discussion and questions. Um, just so you know, uh, kind of processing wise, um, there's really at the end of this, there's no action requested of the committee this evening. Um, that will actually come as part of the budget recommendation uh, for next year uh, at our next meeting in. February when we, we recommend that I'll be including a recommendation in that that document uh, but wanted to have the discussion with you this evening to be able to talk talk some of this through we answer <coughs> any questions you may have um, and again just thank and appreciate the work Bill the staff and uh, the members of the, the planning committee put into this All right, anybody have any questions <coughs> just a comment I want to say that a lot of the parents I've spoken to uh, this one-to-one -one has come up and uh, there's a lot of people that are really excited for it so thank you for doing all the work Great. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing it. Anybody else? Yeah. So a couple things. Um, one is, is, is there any cost savings to us as a result of implementing this? Or will, like, is for, in other words, will there be other things that we won't have to necessarily invest money in because we're going to be doing this? Yeah. I, I, out of the gates, there's not going to be a cost savings. Uh, as... You know, as teachers learn to uh, create more digital content and deliver everything digitally, you will definitely see a cost savings in things like paper and toner, uh, you know, just copier costs. Uh, you know, will it be to the point that will save $225,000? I, I don't know that. Uh, but I think savings will be significant on the digital side of things. Uh, you know, and I expect to see that... Uh, you know, like this committee's talked about, I don't expect every fifth grade and ninth grade teacher next year to have every single one of their classes digitized and ready to go on the first day. That's not possible. It's not, uh, it's not even a realistic expectation. This is going to take time to phase in, but that's why we've sort of phased this in over a four-year period. Everyone's going to get the opportunity to sort of build and grow. But I think by the time you see... Uh, the fourth year of the implementation, you'll see many, many of those uh, paper costs and things like that definitely diminish. Will textbooks be uh, you know, eventually available online on these computers? So many of our textbooks are available online right now. Uh, you know, and there are, are various other things that uh, Dr. Hirsch and I have talked about and, and uh, her folks, you know, and that's namely getting PDF copies of books, uh, because we already have paid for these uh, licenses and things like that, and being able to share those out to students through through Classroom. Um, you know, so, look, make no mistake, the textbook companies, they're not allowed to lose money. They're still gonna charge you for uh, every kid accessing a book. Whether or not we have a hard cover book, 
being brought home every night, uh, you know, that's a different story. But uh, they're still going to get their, their money. Absolutely. But you can do that, too. That takes the burden off the kids, too, of keep bringing those books back and forth. Yeah, that's kind of what I was getting yeah. at. I yeah. didn't know if it would be yeah, less you can expensive. You PDF copy of right. it to access if you're on chapter or something. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, but it right. is hard with the licensing because the licensing is uh, as expensive as the book. Thank so you. that's kind of what he's talking yeah, about. Yeah, no, I kind of, I was hoping it would be a little less years. expensive, you know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Call me crazy. Over you the years, that backpack thing. will get smaller, though. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, that was another thing that came up in the committee. I don't, you know, if you walk through, especially in middle school, I see it. These poor yeah. kids yeah. and the 300-pound binder that they have in front of them, sometimes the binder, I swear, is bigger than the kid holding it. And, uh, you know, like, that's another thing that definitely can Absolutely. go away over time. You know, everything becomes available to the, to the child in their Google account, you know. They don't have to carry all of that stuff around. Also, you know, things like school supplies for, for parents in the summertime, they don't have to go nuts running around finding, you know, four red notebooks or, you know, whatnot, because everything will be online. Uh, running tradition. <laughs> um. <laughs> Um, why grade five? Why grade five and nine as opposed to grade seven, say, for example? So the, the way that I like to see this work out is that we perform a four-year lease of the device. Um, so if we start in grade five, obviously that takes them right through the end of their middle school career, at which point they turn that device back in, get a new one in ninth grade, and then take that through 12. Um, if we sort of put it halfway, I just feel like it would get kind of funny with the leases and then you know when do they turn the device in now i've got a device that's two years old do i give that to the new seventh grader so this makes it clean everyone starts from five and nine and they but keep there's the no issues like developmentally for kids okay all right I was it just makes more sense too just the, the structure we have set up of grade five through eight and then nine through twelve yep I think, can That's I jump I, in for one second? Yes, I'm sorry. I think the other <laughs> thing that, um, that we're also looking at is um, last year, our, like all of our fourth grade students are currently in the modular classrooms in the new schools. Right. So they have the newest and latest technology uh, uh -huh. in the buildings. And then, so they're used to this kind of digital instruction. Right. Um, they're used to having the newest, um, it's Clear escaping me, TVs, yeah. the digital TV mm -hmm. and, and whatnot in their rooms. And then they go into fifth grade and we don't have that right now. So uh, we are also looking, aside from this, at some you know, capital improvements internally um, with some recommendations around, and again, a lot of this is just financially money dependent, but being able to uh, provide that same level of uh, classroom technology in the fifth grades mm -hmm. so that when the students are going from fourth to fifth, they're kind of having a continuum of their experience and they're not having a high intensity tech year in fourth grade and then they go to fifth with nothing. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, we will be looking to out because we can't do it all at the same time, but outgrade, uh, outfit, the, say, the fifth grade classrooms with the interactive technology like we have in fourth grade. They then have the device they use to fifth grade, and we can do it year by year. Um, we financially couldn't afford to do eight grade levels at the same time. Sure. And um, I think it makes sense continuity of instruction-wise to go from fourth having it up to fifth and having it and continuing on with the student. Okay. So that was part of the rationale as well. I keep going. You, you may now go, yes. Okay. No, no, I meant, is it okay if I keep asking questions? Oh, no, please, yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to jump in. Hey, we'll I, I just wrote these down. There's no, like, stop it. There's, there's no particular, <laughs> it's just what popped into my head <coughs> as I was going through this. Um, how, how much of, uh, so I guess, so I'm looking at this as a teacher, right? And I'm, and I'm thinking about, like, how would, how would this work? And how much time will it be used in instruction? And does it take away from... You know that very important face-to-face -face type of instruction and then beyond that how does this interface with our social emotional learning that we're trying to also promote in the classroom and whatnot right so I mean I'll, I'll speak to the does it take away from the face-to-face -face learning it absolutely doesn't um, if anything it gives an opportunity to make that better um, right now a teacher might not have the capacity because there is not enough technology to set up a couple of stations in their room for kids to work on other things while they have these five kids with similar abilities in front of them. If I give them that opportunity, it only improves the amount of time that they can spend with those kids <coughs> with like, like abilities. Um, well, but then you're assuming that the ones that you've left to work independently are actually working independently. Certainly, you know, there's going to be that there's going to be a process to that, right? So that's going to become 
about classroom management. It's going to become about setting high expectations for kids. It's it's about things that teachers know how to do. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what they do for a living, right? right. So uh, I don't have a concern that a teacher is not going to be able to manage their class and get the kids to work on the appropriate things that they that they need to work on. I think the bigger thing is, you know. What, what's the preparation to get to that point look like for teachers, right? Because there's a, there's a heavy lift in the beginning to mm-hmm. this. But once they've done that lift, then they can reuse all that information year in and year out, semester in and semester. I think, agree, Bill. We have a one-on-one, and we, you know, we're probably in our fifth or sixth year. And it, it is a learning experience the mm-hmm. first couple of years. And, but you know, once you get used to it you know, as a teacher, it's, you know, it is a great tool. Absolutely, and I, I can completely see that. I really can. I, I, I'm... I think I'm asking uh, just for clarification for my own purposes, but also for people watching at home, you know, that may not um, be as familiar with the one-to-one process. Yeah, yeah, make no mistake. Like, this is not all of a sudden kids are coming to school, they sit in front of the computer all day, and the computer is the only thing that they're learning from. They wouldn't come to to school if that was the case. They'd be in an online uh, school or something like that. Um, This is... This is not what we're looking to accomplish is to have technology not be an addition to the curriculum, but a, a seamless uh, integration, uh, you know, an immersion mm-hmm. into the curriculum. So it becomes a fundamental part of delivering the curriculum. Mm-hmm. And then I'm sure you know kids can get around anything. It's amazing. Just some, absolutely fascinating. Some me. things, yeah. yes. Um, so how will we make sure that um, we're, you know, monitoring this and that? Uh, um, you know, kids aren't. Um, I know that they're going. There's an agreement that they're going to right. sign on to, but you know, so uh, kids right now uh, obviously use technology in, in the district daily. Um, we have a, a filter and firewall system in place that is SIPA compliant, uh, which it has to be uh, for schools, and that does the the filtering of you know the naughty websites, things that they shouldn't be allowed to get to. Um, do sometimes, you know, uh, sometimes can they slide through? Yeah, occasionally they do, but generally uh, those types of things are detected and then a rule is written that, you know, stops them from doing that. Right. Sometimes within minutes, sometimes, you know, uh, even less. So will they always try? Absolutely. Can I stop them from going on their, their phone or tethering off of their right. phone? Not right now. We're looking at systems that will disable that, but... Um, you know, we'll we'll continue to provide the the best possible uh, security that we can and uh, keep them safe while they're with us. Why not BYOB? Yeah, I you know we could have gone down that road. Uh, this district. B- BYOD. <laughs> I said it's not equitable. Sorry, sorry. I said not BYOB. BYOD. Yeah. 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 I was like, wow, where's my mind tonight, huh? <laughs> I saw Eileen Young and immediately think BYOB. I don't know why that was. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so be, uh, bring your own device uh, has been available in Chelmsford for years, since before my tenure here. Uh, but the only thing we see kids bringing are phones for the most right. part. Yeah. All right. Uh, a couple of kids may bring laptops now and again. And they're certainly still welcome to do that. That's why the the policy exists. Um, But the biggest trouble to to that is that we can't guarantee equitable access for every single kid that way. If I supply the device, I know every single one of these kids has exactly the device that I want them to have uh, that's going to perform the way that we need it to perform and let teachers do what they need to do with it to make sure that the kids get the proper instruction. Um, Outside of that, if I just let them bring whatever they want, um, I have no control over them, I can't manage them, I can't stop them from doing certain things, and you need some of that uh, type of oversight when it comes to a mass deployment. Um, And what if parents refuse to participate in the training? Is there any, it's just, it's optional for them? Yeah, I'm, I don't, uh, s- some parents obviously are going to be very tech savvy. Some just want to come by and maybe ask questions. If, if folks don't have any questions, they just want to sign the document, I don't have a problem with okay. that. Okay. Thank you. John, you have something? 
Yeah, so just a quick question. Um, so kids are going to be using these and there's a potential that they're going to have PII, they're going to have social media accounts, things like that. Are you going to have um, the ability to do um, remote wipes, um, tracking, anything like that in case um, a laptop gets stolen? or? Yeah, so essentially when we set these up in our management system, yep. only the user that it's assigned to will, is, uh, will be the only one that can log into that device. Sure. If someone takes it, it's a brick to them. Uh, even if they were to go ahead and power wash a, the device or you know format it, anything, as soon as it comes back online, it checks in with Google. Google known, That's what knows that I own the device and immediately applies our policies again. So it's a registered device. That's That was the exact question I was asking. Okay. Thank you. I think you did a tremendous amount of work, yeah, uh, you and your I committee. Uh, you know, I think that it's worth saying that again. It's just a phenomenal job, so thank you. Thank you. Um, what do you guys think? Yeah, um, I would love that to have yeah. it be able to have the Chromebooks. <laughs> it's such a great help to be able to have like everything, especially having Google Classroom. Um, a couple of my classes have that, and it just it's very organized. I have it for my Spanish class, and I I know what I have for homework. I know what my assignments are for the day. I all my research is on there. It's everything's kind of compact. Where like in other classes where it's not like that, it's you're running around through your folders yeah. and you're going through papers and you're trying to find the syllabus. And it's just it's much easier to have everything in one place. Um, and with that, I I went to a semester school sophomore year and we had computers there. And it was so helpful for me to like be able to take notes on my computer and just have that with me constantly. Um, so that when I went home, first of all, I could like be working on notes with other people. I could be doing collaborative notes. So, like if I had questions, I could ask my friends as like, if I was getting a lecture, I could ask my friends as it was happening. Or we could go over something and I could like star things right then and there and make sure that I knew to ask questions from my teacher, from friends, or whatever. And it was so helpful to have that access um, constantly and not have to like be flipping three different pages that are if I forget my notebook one day, I have to write it in a different notebook and then have to transfer it all over at some point or just lose those notes um, for like review when it comes to mid-years or finals. And I just think that this is gonna be so helpful for the students. Donna, as you know too, you, when they go to college, yes, you absolutely. have to <coughs> buy your own Device. Believe me, I bought a few um, for your students, and yes. it, they lose those yes. too. Yes. But all of the platforms, even yes. if it's a face-to-face -face class in college, is going to go through a Blackboard platform. Absolutely. So yes. it's the best way to have that. Yes. And um, some of the other pieces too is that you know when you build that content, if you have a new teacher that's coming into the district, wow, how great would it be to know that at least here's this guide that you can start to build upon for yourself because we can transfer those classes over. And for the teacher to come back instead of, I mean, we've had those moments where you say, what, what exactly did they do in that, that class? You would now take, it's almost like a virtual notes for yourself. Absolutely. And a lot of the young teachers, I mean, sorry, this is how they, this is what they know. Right. Yeah. You know, this is just what they I'm, know. I'm with my computer. Right. This is my oh. brain. Right. Al Donna, I mean, uh, Al Barbara, nope. is it? Any questions? So one um, thing, I know that this is going to come up, but I, 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 when I've gone to my PTO meetings or my other liaisons uh, meetings, I have brought this up looking for feedback. But I do, I do think this is, it's important to remind parents that we still are encouraging you know, questions and feedback um, about oh, this. Sure. From, from your end, I mean, you know, if, if this were to be approved by the committee and it's going to go in front of town meeting as part of the budget process, I want to talk about April, do you foresee any problems implementing you know, getting devices and, and, and inventory and devices and setting your policies, finalizing them, and, you know, getting everybody trained for next fall? No. A lot of, uh, you know, luckily for us, we've run the graduate um, blended learning class several times. A lot of our fifth grade teachers have taken it. Many of our ninth grade teachers have taken it. Um, Right after February vacation, we're going to open up the uh, self-paced courses. <laughs> so that'll allow anyone who didn't get to take the blended learning, they'll have the whole rest of the year and through the summer to do that. Um, and as far as preparing everything to go out, uh, no, uh, we've had bigger projects than this, so uh, this, will, this will be an easy summer. I was just going to say from the funding standpoint as well, I don't anticipate actually waiting until the April town meeting to sure make an action. Uh, school choice. With yeah. school choice funding, it's actually available to you at this yeah, point. So it will be included within the budget document. But actually when the school committee reviews and approves the budget at the end of February um, and you vote to adopt the budget technically with school choice money, 
we'll then actually just move forward with the implementation. We won't have to wait until April town meeting because it's not contingent on town meeting funding. Um, I still want you to take, you know, see the overall budget recommendation, take the time to review it. But when we actually um, have the school committee level um, appropriation of the budget or recommendation of the budget, that's when uh, we'll actually start to kind of act. So that buys us yeah, two months yeah. as well, which is, um, which is significant. And I just want to add, you know, even just for my own kids, um, you know, one high school age um, who's not always, um, um, you know, the most in line as far as having, like, all his documentation together, um, he utilizes a one-on-one -on -one type of um, uh, program. It's great organizationally to see him be able to, say, go into the Google Classroom or see his notes and text. You know, we don't have as many uh, things where, oh, I forgot something, a book at school, or I don't know what particular note this is. To be able to have it all there has really kind of helped, and I can see this helping with some of the students with, say, executive functioning issues and, and needs to try to help them uh, kind of organize themselves a little bit. Um, so I do think it's, it's um, you know, certainly a good, obviously a good initiative. Um, yeah, but I think it's going to yeah. help a lot with, uh, with those kids to help organize. I, and I don't disagree. I mean, like I said, this is something that I use in the classroom. Right. Um, I, I think it's incredibly helpful. Um, I really don't know what I would do without my technology. Um, it just, I take my attendance on my phone, you know, if I don't have my computer with me. I mean, there's just so much that technology allows us to be able to do these days. And it is just becoming um, the way of the world, right. you know. But I, I, do, I do think that we have to be mindful um, that technology has also been, um, you know, a real... Uh, problem uh, you know in in some ways for kids and so you know I just want to make sure that we have that balance that's all and you know I think that you know my, my questions tonight um, after I've gone through the documents and everything um, were, were also to help people at home understand sure. you know um, some some things that maybe you know that might jump out at them mm -hmm. um, in terms of questions or you know things that that they may be worried about um, right. and I and I do encourage them to, to reach out to us or to you um, or, or your committee for, um, you know, for further clarification or, or whatever it might be. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you raise many really great points. And, you know, our document does include things like resources to, uh, you know, online safety. And we teach that to our kids from the time they enter kindergarten all the way to the time they leave. We constantly are teaching them about uh, online safety and digital citizenship. And these are all... Uh, you know components that kids need to have because technology is great there will always be that underlying area of uh, you know things that you hope that they don't get into right. uh, as far as technology goes but you know if you're educating them and you're training them what to be on the lookout for uh, we should hopefully be able to overcome that just one more quick question um, so students I know they're gonna have the, the laptop um, are they going to be able to access the Google Classrooms to say, like, they have a desktop at home they prefer to use? Absolutely. So they'll be able to use the login? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah they'll, they'll be able to log into that device. They can also log into the Chrome browser from any Internet-enabled device Perfect. and access their classroom. That's great. Okay. Just, and I'm not trying to belabor this, but, like, one further thing that's helpful. Well, you asked good questions. Mm -hmm. You really did. But, you know, part of the reason to do this as opposed to, say, just to bring your own device is that because we'll actually kind of, it gives us more control. You know, we'll technically own the device. I do see this saving some money when it comes to, say, the testing and assessment. Like, right. we've had to buy additional Chromebook carts to be able to accommodate the online testing. Right. When we have uh, individual students now having their own device, we're going to be able to, you know, not have to purchase separate right. Chromebook carts. These devices we can, can take control of for the testing window and implement. We could not do the testing right. on a personal device because we can't control that device. Exactly, yes. Um, so this certainly, uh, you know, in the long run, when it comes to that, if we have every student in uh, 5 through uh, 12 having their own device, you know, we're not going to need to buy additional cards for the school because every every kid would have a device. Um, so there was some savings there, but there was also that control factor that we can actually kind of help and um, why it makes more sense to do this as opposed to just a strict bring-your-own device. And now will those... Chromebooks we have filtered out of the elementary school then? Yeah, I mean, right now they'll be able to still be utilized, say, in grades six, six through eight next yeah. year or the high school, but eventually, yeah, we're just going to have to um, provide them to the elementary level. Yeah. Okay. And Bill, you're right, we're not the first community. When we were at the conference in right. November, there was a lot of talk about communities that are, have already implemented this. Right. Um, do you know any on top of your head if parents want to 
you know, I think they probably have some information on their websites and whatnot that they could look at. Um, some communities that are already doing it. Oh, just a c couple districts. Westford has this in, in their high school. Barlington has it. Uh, Methuen has it. Uh, just three right, right near us. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. Everybody good? Great. I'm good. Thank great. you again, Bill. Yeah, and thank you very much. Thank you, the committee, very much for all thank the work. Thank uh, for coming. <clears throat> great. Um, oh, good night, girls. Thank uh, next report of the evening, uh, report number five, I'm actually going to ask Joanna um, to review the second quarter financial report with you. Uh, this is our fiscal 2019 uh, report through December 31st. Thank you. In your packet, there's um, you know, four documents. One is my cover memo. It highlights some of the variances, uh, favorable and unfavorable. Then the year-to-date budget report through December, the grant and revolving fund summary, and the student activity account balances for the high school and each middle school. Overall, the um, district is on target with all their um, finances. There are some areas um, where we're favorable. On page three, the first one is in the curriculum director, and right now we're 110,655,000 ,650 favorable. And one variance that will remain favorable is the, um, we had a vacancy for the coordinator of SEL and counseling services from August through December. Um, so that is um, a third of the variance. 34,498 favorable. The rest um, will just spend on target throughout the year. The next favorable variance is on, on pages five through seven, instruction classroom teachers. And overall that variance is favorable by $400,671. And um, one component, uh, in We've talked about these in the last quarter. They kind of popped right away, and they'll continue. The lane change account is favorable by 66,366, and that um, all the lane changes have been implemented. As a refresher, that's when a teacher achieves a higher degree. And then the, uh, the remaining balances, um, we've talked about this. We budget vacancies at a master step three. But if a teacher comes in um, and let's say they're at a bachelor step one, we'd be at a favorable variance because of that difference. And conversely, if an internal transfer comes in at a master's step 11, it would be unfavorable. But overall, with all those ins and outs, with all those hundreds of teachers, it nets to a favorable variance. On page seven, the specialist teachers is a slightly unfavorable $2,374. And this category is for the um, special education teachers, reading, ELL, those type of specialists. And as a refresher, we um, budgeted an offset to the CHIPS revolving fund for $115,000. we will make that journal entry in the fourth quarter of fiscal 19, and then the category will be favorable. The next variance um, is in school security, page 17. And um, we're slightly unfavorable. If you uh, recall in the September 18th school committee meeting, we talked about uh, having an offset to the transportation revolving fund. Um, and that journal entry, uh, again, will be made in the fourth quarter, and then this category will be slightly favorable. And then on page 19, the special ed out of district tuitions. Uh, you're familiar with this chart and <coughs> the areas that fund the uh, special ed out of district tuitions. This 
looks unfavorable right now because we haven't made any of the journal entries for the offsets. We'll do that also at, in the fourth quarter. Overall, we think special ed out of district tuitions will be seven million four hundred fifty thousand in total tuitions, and then this will be funded um, four million dollars from the local budget. That's the four one one seven nine eight eight, and offset to circuit breaker <coughs> of two point eight million. The school choice revolving fund. 250,000 and then the valley credit 549,502 and after all of that is completed um, we'll still um, be slightly favorable that's that highlighted number the 267 490 below that chart is the school choice revolving fund uh, we had a carryover balance, 1.3 million. Um, we've received revenue 211,916. These first part of the fiscal year, so we're up it to the 1.5 million. We'll still receive more revenue. Um, 1.6 million um, before the offset to special ed tuitions we talked about. And then this dovetails with uh, what Bill Silver just talked about, the balance of the school choice revolving fund should be 1.365 million at the end of this fiscal year. I'm gonna pause and ask if we have any questions about the local budget before we move on to the grants and the revolving funds. Okay. Very comprehensive as always. <coughs> Very comprehensive as always. Agreed. The grant revolving funds is a, a one page summary. Um, the very top is uh, we had some carryover funds. The entitlement grants are two year um, duration now. They're all uh, finished uh, with the exception of special ed, um, and that one will <coughs> wrap up. Amy thinks um, within, you know, maybe by April, May time frame. Then the next section is the fiscal 19 grants and they're all on target. Um, the third section is some of the private grants. Um, E-rate is in there. We received 36,138.38 and we have spent those funds then the lower section are the revolving accounts such as food service athletics school choice again transportation student activity all our um, no funds are in deficit and you can see we are expecting the balances to grow. Any questions on the grant or revolving fund summary? And uh, the last um, reports are the student activity account balances by club. Uh, one for the high school, um, 285,000 in there. And then the McCarthy, a little over 41,000, and Parker, a little over 54,000. And then you can see the balance by club. Now we've taken out, we've talked about taking out clubs that haven't been active for a while. We haven't do that yet, or? Yes. Okay. Yep. Uh, we're, that's, uh, we've, uh, we, you approve the process of us, um, or um, we've done it with the high school. We uh, brought it over to Steve and reviewed it with him, and he signed off on the documents. And then we rolled that into that we call it the other general student body fund now. And then we're starting that process with the middle schools. Yeah, yeah I see that.
right, any questions? That's oh, really nice. No, looks good. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Great. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there's, um, <coughs> I don't know, there's, there's no issues uh, financially. We're in solid shape, both on salary, non salary accounts, no action required tonight. Uh, no transfers or, or anything. So just as a kind of a report of progress. Great. Um, the next report, um, this actually came out of our last meeting. Um, Linda prepared a memo on dyslexia screening and what the, uh, the district was doing on that. So I'd ask Linda to report. Sure. Um, I saw that you would ask for just a little bit of an update. And it's kind of an update slash non-update at the same time. So they did make that approval for the legislation to have the dyslexia screening, which actually falls under neurological disorders. So it's not just a dyslexia screening. It is actually looking for that piece of neurological disorders on top of that. And they're still in the process of coming up with um, what the protocol is going to look like, what the screeners could possibly be. So they're not making any recommendations at this point. They're just having a lot of discussions, a lot of um, uh, webinars involved, and we have had a chance to sit down and kind of talk about like, what does this look like for Chelmsford. One change that we did make is on this current application for students coming in for kindergarten on top of the questions around, you know, do your children have any learning disabilities and IEP coming from either another district or even within our own district, we did add the question in there of any neurological disorders so that at least we have that precursor um, that when we do get into the screening, we're not now going backwards to our K students. It is my understanding that it's not just for your kindergarten screening, you're supposed to screen them K-1-2. <coughs> so what that tier is going to look like, you know, it, it's, it's yet to be decided. So as we go through this process, we'll be looking at these screeners. They did provide some. A lot of them are out of California, believe it or not. So we are reading them, seeing what that looks like, and um, we do have some teachers that would be willing to start to you know, pilot a screener. Because as you know, our kindergartners come in, and it's more of like a a quick uh, gross motor, some quick facts for them. We're also looking at the students as they come in to see, you know, what is their hesitation when they walk into school. So that that screener does not pick up, though, for anything that would pick up for um, dyslexia. And then obviously we use our DIBL screening for our literacy skills, and that helps the kindergarten teachers actually group them for their reading skills. So. Unfortunately, we don't have anything in place perfect for the next school year, but we'll be looking at different options that are available to us and the teachers are really looking into what does this look like because this is something that we'd, we'd want to address as students go through because it will affect their uh, literacy skills, which will then affect all of their school, uh, schooling skills as they go along. Any questions? Um, you know, with these new guidelines going into place, uh, I would guess that we're going to identify more kids that have these. Where do we go from there? You know, once we start identifying more kids, what What's do we do program programming and everything like that? Right. Actually, yeah. I was going to bring that up under budget, under our budget discussion. Yeah. Well, because it would it, be a, yeah. a specific learning disability, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's not as if it's just a screener for us to be working within right. the classroom, but then also educating the teachers. I mean, for example, we have the new L screening. We they just went down to the Chips program and they screened 55. CHIP students for L services as when they come into the school district. So every initiative that comes in, right, you're right. right. What, so now these kids will be coming to kindergarten. Right. What that is that going to look right. like yeah. for those teachers? And what's, I mean, the good thing for us is at least based on the caseloads at the different schools, the L teachers will pick up a caseload. They're almost, even though they're school based, they're kind of district based. So they know that if they have a uh, room in their schedule, they'll go over and support that teacher. But then it's that, it, it, it's a hit or miss of like what school is going to have the largest <coughs> population of L's. You don't know. Right. And they don't necessarily tell you what the process it is that you should implement, nor did they send a million dollars down. Oh, but, absolutely. Right, you know, right. the in order to be able, right, exactly. We already yeah. started just to take a look at what those screeners in and of themselves look like. I mean, they, you know, you're looking at $500 a packet. So how many do we have to get? Right. Who's going to be? And but I think you're trying to get it not only the initial cost of the screener, but what are the interventions and the services going to be? And that's, that's what I was going to talk about. And it's not just that yeah. intervention separate. It has to be like a double dip in the classroom, right. similar right. to the reading right. pieces where we pull kids out for reading services, but then there has to be that piece. So that's educating all the teachers as to what those strategies are going to look like for when the students are in the classroom. So it's it's a it's always a moving target. We tend to do very well with it. I mean, even when the new regulations came in for our students, 
um, for L's, well, so they weren't new. We just finally started following the law. Um, and we have all our different programming for those students, and there was a significant difference. You can see that even in the testing. So um, the good news is, is that we have both special ed and we have our reading coordinator on top of it. And we'll just, as we go along, we'll, we'll provide as much support as possible until we actually have a real plan in place. I think Amy Reese's, um, one of her areas of expertise is in um, reading. Right. And, uh, yeah, and I think this is something that she was very, very interested in. And we'll bring this up, too, at, like, the, we get together as di uh, different districts. Mm -hmm. We all have the same problems. So we kind of say, okay, what are you doing? What are you doing? How can we implement that in our school district? So this it will come up at the next topic at one of our um, roundtables. We currently have students in our district who receive services for dyslexia, though, right? They've been identified. If they've been identified, they would receive services. Okay. But this is now, instead of waiting until it's fourth, fifth, sixth grade, you have to do a screening to see if there would be some type of um, disability coming forward that maybe if we do the remediation now, it will not be as significant. You want to close that gap as much as possible because those reading skills are going to be in place by, you know, third third grade. I, I think we've heard from a lot of parents, though, that, that uh, you know, that what's in place may not necessarily be enough. Correct. So. I think the problem that we have is we haven't been able to quantify what some of those costs will be right. until we kind of get through this initial round of screening, whatever that's determined to be, well, to figure out how many additional kids are going to be identified. And the screening in and of itself, I mean, we send in teams of to go in and do the Dibble screening for our kindergarten students. Now you need you need to deploy people out to do the screening, especially if you have to go back to, okay, it's K1 and 2. So who are we pulling? What's that team going to look like? What will be the use of our interventionists? And then that person has to learn the screener. <coughs> So it's all these little moving parts that go with it. Right. And we will. We'll come up with a strategy to be able to do the screening rather than, a, you know, saying to the classroom teacher, okay, this is something you have to do. They may not have the expertise in it. So we'll put together some type of teams, but that comes at a cost. It comes at time. And, you know, we, we only have so many bodies and only so much time during the school day. So as we get that in, though, at least our incoming K kids <coughs> will eventually be captured prior to entering school. I hate to use the word captured. It probably is not the best word. <laughs> Grab them. <laughs> Put them somewhere. But no, we'll, we'll get through it. It's just that we don't have enough information. We're learning it and, you know, sailing the ship at the same time. Good. Questions? Was that what's right? Great. Thank you. Uh, item 7 in the evening is the personnel report for the month of December. Uh, so, again, this is your um, uh, list of... Uh, new hires, resignations, we didn't have any retirements in December, and uh, we had an assignment change of one of our uh, paraprofessionals in the district. Uh, but just very little personnel activity for the month of December, but wanted to share that with you. Uh, no action required, just a point of information. Any questions? Um, all you? Yeah. Um, we're, again, we're opening up uh, the meeting. Anybody that has questions on the budget? Um, Seeing none, anybody on the committee have questions or comments in terms of budget? Yeah, one thing I did want to um, mention from the last meeting, um, we had um, someone uh, talk about the um, social work uh, piece. And I recall that at the tribe board meeting, actually, Paul is looking to um, hire someone for the town. Um, I don't know if you remember that. Social worker? Yep. Uh, well, actually, he's calling it a community services coordinator. Um, it was part of the packet, part of what he'll be including in his budget. Yeah. Um, he did. He had yeah. something to the effect of you know helping people transition within the town, maybe the elderly, because there's they don't have a place to maybe access that. So, and I um, I had a chance to speak with him today, and he said this would be available to, to everybody in town. Obviously, you know, families with kids in school and and things like that. So, I know that's I'll, not. I'll follow up with him. Sure. Okay, and I, I know that it's not you know a complete answer. Right. Uh, but it is um, it is something that will be coming before a town meeting as part of the budget for us to approve um, because he did recognize the need in the, for us as a community to have someone in place that can direct people to the appropriate resources when they're in need. Um, so I wanted to follow up on that piece um, oh, about, the, um, um, about the social worker. I think with the title it didn't, it didn't click with yeah, me. Yeah, he called it something different, but it's, it seems like a social work yes. component. Yes, right. So I know the governor's budget's coming out on the 24th. Friday. And then, um, and there's, I think, is it a, 
I had a 2.7% increase in local aid. Do you have any idea what that will look like for us? Probably not, right? No, what's going to end up happening is there's a conference call Wednesday, which is tomorrow. I'm off because of the holiday. Um, but then the governor's budget, I believe, comes up Friday, mm -hmm. sometime in the morning. By the afternoon uh, is typically when, uh, like DOE, would run what Chapter 70 numbers would be. Um, DOR would do that for the uh, for the town. So if you want, Paul usually provides us an email um, with those increases. Um, if I see it first on Friday, I'll coordinate with him. But we'll send you out something Friday afternoon. Great. Um, just telling you what that is. I honestly wouldn't know off the top of my head what we'll, what we'll get until the recommendation comes out. All right. And then following up on the social work piece, um, I know that we have our um, new student support uh, person in place. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think that one of the things that we have to take a look at, because social workers have been, uh, I think, a topic that's come up over the last several years. But I think we do have to have a better handle on what do we have right. and, and what do we need. And what we would define if we were to hire social, what would their role be? Right. Um, because I think that what they would be uh, for us may be very different than what the general public may imagine them to be. Mm -hmm. So I don't see that, I, for example, I don't view them as being clinicians. I don't, I don't think that that would be, but they may be um, someone who could um, put a family in touch with uh, somebody who could provide some type of counseling and things like that. Um, and the reason I say that is is because, um, you know, just for continuity's sake, uh, you know, we, we, we have our vacations and summers and things like that. If you had kids who needed some type of support um, on an ongoing basis, you know, um, you'd want to have somebody in place who could provide that. So I think we need right. to make sure that we're, we're on the Rock same on the page, okay. you know, about what, what social workers would be, what, what they would do in a school setting. Okay. Um, and so I don't know if, if she's, uh, I, I'm sorry, I apologize, I cannot remember. Uh, Lorraine Wilson. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. I actually met with her today. Okay. Uh, and this is one of the things I asked her to put on her radar, just as she goes around and meets with the individual principals and department um, coordinators and whatnot, um, to just take a look at, <coughs> excuse me, our current staffing model. Um, because, again, we haven't traditionally used social workers, our um, school psychologists and our school counselors have kind of between those two roles done a lot of social work or traditional social work type activities. Right. Um, so I gave her some of the backdrop and, and background information, um, you know, asked her to take a look at what systems and um, staffing models that she was familiar with uh, in her districts that she's come from, um, filled her in a little bit with some of my experiences and what we kind of have here in Chelmsford and have asked her to really, you know, kind of dig deeper into that as she meets individuals with schools. Um, I think one of the areas that, um, and again, how it all shakes out, I don't fully know yet at this point, um, but one of the roles that I see a social worker playing that I think we um, don't probably do now, which there's probably some um, need for, is obviously within the um, mental health community, there is a, a huge, um, the, the demand outweighs the, the resources right now. Um, but having some individuals be able to maybe help families navigate um, counseling services outside of the school system. Our, again, uh, school counselors and psychologists do a lot of groups within the school, similar to like what you'd see on a SPED service delivery grid. Um, but the, the families and the students need resources outside of the school system also. So someone to help them kind of navigate with that. Um, a lot of our staff currently also say don't go out and do home visits, which oftentimes social workers would do. Um, so, you know, I just kind of put that on her radar to ask her to take a look at what we're currently offering, what if that role were introduced to the district, it would really mean how it would fit in, because we're not looking to totally change our service delivery model, um, but how it would actually integrate and not have people kind of stepping on each other's toes or duplication of services to really have it be maximized. Um, so she is, she is taking a look at that. Okay. Um, and, and the other thing is, I, I'm not sure I really have a good handle <coughs> on, like, what percentage of our student population are we talking about that's, you know, in need of these types of services for families, families and students, I should say? Um, I wouldn't be able to just throw a percentage out. Uh, yeah, if, so I was just kind of curious, because, I mean, I think this is <coughs> one of the things, I mean, we talk about this, but we don't really... Right. I'm not sure that there's, I mean, I don't know how, what kind of data we have that we would base it. this right. decision. So the difficult piece to quantify is like, so we know on children's IEPs exactly how much of the service delivery grade, again, has, say, psychologist time, um, school counselor time, things like that. But a lot of our psychologists and, and um, 
school counselors are also seeing non-special ed students right. who might just be in you know, a crisis. Right. Now, they might be going through the process. They might just be a regular ed, uh, general ed student that needs additional supports. That's what's difficult to quantify without, you know, actually going to talk to each of the counselors and having them kind of figure mm -hmm. out their caseload, what time is it being used for, things along those lines. I could tell you based on the SPED numbers, you know, what percentage of staff time is tied to, say, um, supporting different social groups and lunch groups and things like that. Um, but I don't have that data for the non-special ed students. Because so I, I just, you know, as, as, as I said, I think we've identified that it is, right. uh, in the, the number is increasing. And I, right. and I think that in addition to defining what those roles should be, I think we have to define, you know, uh, whether or not we have enough. Um, no, I agree. And I think the other thing is, too, because I do think we provide some very good interventions, we're probably also... Um, stopping things before they become a crisis with, right. with some students. And again, that's sometimes difficult to quantify, um, but we will look at that for you. And then the other thing I wanted to bring up with regards to the uh, budget is um, the librarian, because that's come up for several years now um, uh, at Chelmsford High School. And um, we had someone in place that you know, provided a certain set of services. You know, Where are those services being provided now and with the implementation possibly of the one-to-one -one learning, you know, is it necessary? Um, is that something we should be taking a look at again? And if we aren't, why? Um, can you elaborate on that a little bit as far as how it ties into the one-on-one? -on -one? Just in terms of um, the type of research that kids would do, the type of thinking that they would, um, I think this is something that, that librarians really assist with, um, you know, in helping kids to be able to navigate you know, all of the information out there and helping them to be able to uh, um, um, be objective in their thinking. I'm, I'm just going by my experience with uh, the person that I work with, but they, right. re they really help them, as I said, navigate all of the different uh, uh, pieces of it. I'm, yes, I know. I, I was thinking that right there. I, I, was, I could feel her right behind me. So, um, you know, <laughs> yeah. Were there more on the page? Yeah. So. <clears throat> Not that I'm aware of, not yeah. the high school level. And the, and the L two middle schools have a high school librarian. High school, I mean, two middle schools have a, <laughs> a librarian. Uh, middle school, and then the high school has their high school librarian, and then the elementary schools have their librarian, you know, support that they have for um, at the for one of their specialists. So you're looking for more. There was no more librarians. I, I think she means replacing the coordinator position that used to be there at one point. Do we oh. need? A, you know, do we need a? Uh, or do we need to? We have like a certified that? high school librarian. Oh, okay. I have two I, certified middle school librarians. Yes. Your elementary don't have to have the certification, but I do know out of the top of my head that one of them holds the certification mm -hmm. as a certified librarian. So you do have to hold that certification. Okay. For some reason, I thought that we had not replaced the certified librarian of the. Yeah, you have. A, yeah, yeah, you have a dedicated high school librarian. Who's certified? Who's certified? Okay. I thought he was working under someone else's certification. No, he's, he's has a, certified. No, he's a certified. Okay. The issue was that there are two d different kinds of certification. Okay. There's a state certification, and there's a library association. Am I correct in that? Um, well, we all have to be certified by the state. Yeah. Um, well, I know that, but I thought that was. You can speak to the differences of, of the certification from the former director and the current. Um, I, I don't think we can talk about personnel right now. I, I don't think that that's appropriate. Nor I feel like Sharon's being put in a position to, to speak about personnel. I just don't think we can compare uh, personnel people at this point. I just don't think that's a good idea. Everyone, I mean, the state, we all have to yeah. be certified. Yeah. I'm still, I'm state still certified here in Massachusetts, in case you want me back. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, everyone has to be certified. Um, and some of the certifications are temporary while people are working on their degrees or you know, advancing, and then after a three-year period or whatever, they move forward with it. Yeah, you have to. Um, you can start off with an initial. That's yeah. for most of our certifications. You can start off with an initial. After right. three years, you can move to a professional license. Right, and then after that, it's every five years yes. to recertify. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, my apologies. For some reason, when we, this came up last year, I didn't think that we had taken the steps to um, put someone in place for that. So, yeah, and I don't feel like we were speaking to people. We were speaking to positions. And there was a director of library services who That's had a I mean. certain certification. Right. And when she was moved out, another employee took a position that wasn't that position. That's the position I'm referring exactly. to. Exactly. Yeah. I understand what you're saying. 
we, we don't have uh, in the CAA bargaining unit anymore a, a director of library services or whatever that title was. Department coordinator um, for libraries. Department for libraries. Mm -hmm. We have a uh, in the teachers bargaining unit. We have a um, school librarian. Okay. Uh, similar to the school librarians we have at the two middle schools. Right. There is no overarching coordinator of library anymore. That is that something <clears> that <throat> we should have? Is that something we should it's consider? Always fall, it's always fallen under the director of technology, okay. um, even the librarian department coordinator position, so right. it's still within that same department. Nothing there has changed. Okay. With Bill's okay. It, would fill under, it would fall under Bill's um, yeah. department. Okay. A big bill night tonight. As I said, as a big, big bill night tonight. <laughs> it is a big as I said, it's something that's come up for the last few years. Right. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that we were taking a look at that and, you know, just had all the information that we needed in order to be able to decide whether or not that was something that we should include in the budget or sure. if it was not necessary at this time. Okay. Anybody else have anything else in terms of budget? Bob? Good question. Um, do we know how the federal shutdown is affecting any of our families? And are we providing information for those families who may cut off from rent money or food or yeah. I'm aware of. I mean no and no um, I haven't heard anything though usually it, that would start at the school level where the principals would know that because th they know their families a little bit better than mm -hmm. perhaps uh, Jay and myself um, and they have nobody has said anything at this point sometimes I don't know about military families that might be impacted yeah we haven't heard anything sometimes it's hard because people are proud and they don't want to say something, it's more of digging in, but that's something we could ask our principals and administrators, just keep an eye out for. Be sensitive to it. Someone is working in a certain field, perhaps, you know, ha in, in passing, have some conversations. Yeah, I mean, this could happen to anybody, right? <coughs> yes, right. Yeah. it and, is. And, and maybe it's worth including in the newsletter periodically, if you are in need of services, yeah, please have. feel free to reach out to. That's a good point. You know, that was, that was it. Yeah, I'd call, yeah, call me, I'll reach out and help them. Yeah. Um, no, no, I think that's a it's a fine idea because you start usually you start to see that with the kids They don't have a lunch. They don't have right. some they couldn't go on a field trip mm -hmm. And I have not heard of that yet, but we should probably just put a little eye on that One other thing we've I've gotten a couple of emails. I'm sure I have about somebody's asking about Sign language is a foreign mm -hmm. language. Yes. That's a possibility, you know I'm just you know, Yeah, so there's a miscommunication. I have got back to those parents. So originally when we collapsed one of the world languages, our idea was to bring in another world language. I was toying around with the idea of ASL. Um, there was just a miscommunication that there was actually an FTE available in the world language department, which there was not. That was just a mistake, um, and that's being rectified at the high school level with the students and the school administration. So it is not in the program of studies. If we do move forward and decide to put in an FTE for uh, world languages for that, that would be the direction that we would like to go in. Um, I think it would just be something new, something fresh, something different. Um, so we do have our French and our Spanish, but we're also offering the additional <coughs> languages after a student has met their graduation requirement for languages to um, take the online courses as well. So that would give them Chinese, um, the higher um, studies of French and Spanish if they want to go above and beyond what they had. That would also give them um, Latin and there's one other that's, oh, German. German. There's one other two that's eluding me right now. So they'll have other, we have more world language offerings than what we even had before, but I would like to go in that direction, but that's just not, that was just a miscommunication. Someone has expressed an interest um, in providing it at the elementary level, so I was going to talk to the wellness committee as they take a look at some of their um, elementary after school enrichment activities and that maybe something like that could be included as part of that. I think the hard part with the elementary or even the middle school schedule at this point is trying to find additional time within the schedule for right. like new offerings right. without taking something away. Right. But um, as an enrichment or an after school type program, uh, if the interest is there, certainly we mm -hmm. could support it. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I can tell you that I, I was always thinking, my gosh, you have to do these languages so much earlier to, to get them. And when I go around to talk to the different um, countries that I've been visiting, most of the, I mean, they're all fluent in multiple languages. The question comes up too is when did they start? Most of them start in fifth grade, so that was that was surprising to me. Um, one thing I do question is it more like conversational language rather than getting deep into the languages, and that will kind of be the next thing I'll I'll dig into. But if we did eventually go in a world language piece rather than seventh grade, maybe fifth grade could be a, a good start. Okay. All right. Any other budget items? So the next meeting you'll be presenting the budget. Is that it? If all goes well. <laughs> if all goes well. <laughs> 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 right. Anyone, will there be public comment in that? 
Um, well, it, because it's not an agenda item, yeah. people could come okay. and speak on it. We posted it specifically for these two meetings yeah. to just get general feedback before we even recommended a budget. Yeah. But no, they could certainly provide uh, public comment on the recommended budget. Um, well, you at know the what? No, they, the at the beginning of the meeting, because right. it's a line item, they won't actually see the, the budget recommendation until that evening. Yeah. But then they certainly can come back again for the budget deliberation the okay. Tuesday after right, yeah. February vacation. Okay. Yeah, and we're still open to you know calls or, yeah. or emails mm -hmm. and um, anything people have. Just, I won't be able to attend that meeting. Right. We'll be thinking of you. <laughs> hey, no field trips, I see. Uh, no, I'm sorry. We put that placeholder on, thinking one was going to come in and it <laughs> didn't. Okay. Um, so no action this evening on field trips and conferences. Uh, any liaison reports? Um, CPAC had a great workshop um, last Thursday, I think it was on. Um, uh, they had someone in from um, the organization to be able to help parents understand, kind of navigate the process of um, the IEP, understand what each section meant, and it was it was a very good, very good uh, workshop. So it was nice that they're offering these types of um, the, you know, opportunities for parents. The library? It was at the library. Yes. Was it attendant? Uh, I want to say there's about ten people there. Um, <clears throat> I did attend the, the BSA meeting last week, and they have a pile of events coming up, so I'm going to actually compile a list for the next meeting and go through them all. But they have a lot of just good activity. They had a lot of really good questions about what's been going on in the committee. So, um, I went to the council schools along with the superintendent. Um, so the council schools, I know Maria Santos came. Last meeting spoke a little bit about the kind of the, the PTO over the PTOs, and they all, all the PTO um, officers get together, and they... You know, they talk about the activities going on at different schools, the fundraisers, and enrichment programs. So it's, it's great to hear all the different things going on. Um, in addition to that, they're sort of in charge of the, the, the pictures, uh, school pictures, and, and a lot of the, the enrichment funding comes from the school pictures, and then that's all kind of orchestrated through, the, through that particular group. Uh, and the other uh, event I went ended up going to was the uh, Valley Collaborative had their stakeholders meeting uh, where they kind of go over their financial position and their programming. And so it's kind of good to see, you know, what they're doing and, you know, all the uh, new additions they have um, and, and seeing where they're at financially. And they seem to be in a pretty good shape at this point, which is good news for us, yeah. you know, and uh, hopefully it's going. Yeah, the only thing that we don't know, they are in very good shape. Um, this is the first year that um, – We've actually increased tuitions for even our member district, <coughs> member district, and the non-member districts. Um, I forget if it's been seven or eight years since they've had to do that. It's certainly an, uh, it's a shift and an adjustment. I don't fully know what that is going to mean for the return that we've been traditionally getting from Valley, um, because if they're actually increasing their tuitions, um, obviously their operating costs are going up. Um, so I'll probably be a little more conservative with Joanna this year as far as a recommendation about how much we potentially, if anything, uh, should budget for a get back from Valley for next year. Um, but, you know, they're certainly in sound financial shape. And I think the last couple of years when we've received almost half a million dollars in um, a return uh, has been great to be able to kind of buffer our circuit breaker account in the end to have a set aside for sped tuition. We knew it was something that we couldn't count on forever as a revenue source, which was wise for us not to fully embed that into our budget. Um, but we'll probably be a little bit more conservative next year just to not get in a situation where we're um, over uh, estimating revenues um, to support the local operating budget for fiscal 20. But uh, they're in good shape. They run great programming. Our um, uh, students who are over there are getting a great education, and it's it's good to see the uh, it's a cohesive board, it's a cohesive uh, group at Valley, and uh, it's good to good to be a member district. All right, any new items you want to bring up? I, a couple. I just want to thank the uh, superintendent for um, getting the school committee handbook online. So now that's under uh, school committee. Yep, well, um, it just well, we're still waiting for the MASC official oh. one, but yes. the but No, but the handbook that we approved. Oh, I put that online. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Oh, okay. Thank you for getting that up there. So that's up there now if anybody wants to just take a look Thank at that. Thank you, Jay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was, <laughs> you're welcome. Yeah. Just yeah. say you're, you're welcome. welcome. And also, um, I know Barbara brought up the uh, um, in the spring we had uh, voted as a committee to support the foundation budget review um, commission. Um, and she noticed that we weren't on the list and, and followed up with, with the right people and Looks like we're on the list now. Yeah, so yeah, you're, you're on the list now. Yeah, so I don't know what happened on the um, that transaction. Debbie actually hunted them down um, to get us on. So we are on the list now yeah. online. Okay. Uh, and the last thing, I just want to remind everybody that next Tuesday we are going to have our public forum right. um, at the uh, police 
training room in the police training room at seven o'clock on um, alternative scheduling, um, whatever, whatever we call it, whatever we called it. So I welcome everybody to come to that, and we'll be discussing a couple different um, things that are out there, um, and, and hopefully we'll get good turnout. You mentioned the police training room last Thursday night. I was there. Um, the Republican Town Committee had a session where um, different people who are currently involved, like Board of Health and School Committee and so forth, to speak about what's required on those different committees. And um, so uh, I was there to speak to the School Committee. They had contacted Dennis and I explained to him what happened. Um, and it went very well, but it was r really well timed because with the handbook of the School Committee online, that's all I really had to tell them. So uh, I just wanted to mention that, that that was put out so if people are looking at running, they have some idea. All right, anything else? Okay, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Five zero.